Each and every day, enjoy the Simple Six menu at Subway. An entire made-for-you meal featuring one of six six six-inch sandwiches like the Italian BMT or Black Forest Ham. With any bag of chips and a 21-ounce drink, all for only $6. Subway. Eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. South by Southwest, my old boss, Jimmy Kimmel. You're a mess already. You have How no you? voice. You're already tired. You're... I know. I, I didn't jump off the top rope last night, but I went to the second rope. Did you? Yeah. We lost track of you somehow. I was trying to get a hold of you. And I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. You were at a bar that uh, I drove by, and I said, oh, well, maybe we'll meet Bill at this bar. And But then they had a sign saying that I had I stuffed my skinny jeans with a sock Yeah, or why something. did they do that? I thought, you, I I thought that was, like, friendly, but apparently it wasn't friendly. I don't, I don't know it was friendly I thought or it not. was like somebody who was like your buddy doing that. I, I just realize. want to know how they know that. That's really what I... <laughs> by the way, that's a beautiful picture of me. Thank you very much. You're for, welcome. To who, whomever put that together. I look like... Uh, well, I look like I look like here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it also looks like they glued my head on somebody else's body there. I, we did, actually. That's, <laughs> did what, that's what we did. Ryan Seacrest's body or something? <laughs> so you, uh, you're, you're back here for the second year. Yes, you were I here am. last year. We were here we for did a whole another week. week of shows. Yeah, same theater. You liked it so much. I love it. And really, it. it's all about the food. That's the only reason you. No, do it's that. not all about the food, but it's primarily yeah, about okay, ninety percent. Because about I'm not big for parties or right. sponsored events or that kind of thing. But the barbecue here is unbelievable. Not just the barbecue. You know, the breakfast tacos. I think is what I'm going to focus on this year because the breakfast tacos. It sounds like you know the same thing you get every place, but. First of all, the tortillas themselves are puffy, which is really nice. Yeah. There's a real puffiness to them that I don't know why we're being cheated out of in L.A. We have these flat tortillas. And then secondly, it's just like they, they will actually like kind of they'll smoke the beef that's in them. The beans are better. Everything's just better here. Egg frittatas, that's another one they have here. Really? I haven't had that yet. Egg frittatas. And they have a little side of salsa. They yeah. call it egg frittata because a frittata is egg, so it's somewhat redundant. Maybe I should have just said frittatas. <laughs> um, <laughs> you just had Obama. Uh, I did. I That's had Obama. That's the biggest guest you've ever had. I've made that decision. You think bigger than Oprah? Bigger than Oprah and bigger than the Armenian comedian. Those are my top three. <laughs> yeah, well, Clinton, too. You know, I guess oh, he'd yeah, be right Clinton. up there. Yeah, President Clinton was on the show. I still think when we had Britney Spears the first year, at the time, how famous she was, that's got to be like in the top seven or eight. Yeah, you remember that? She night? was huge. She was so big that year. I mean, she's still pretty big, yeah, but that but was that a crazy was, thing. Yeah. She decided that night, I don't know if you remember, that it would be funny to come in on a stretcher. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because she had injured her leg and thought everybody knew that, and so she was nobody carrying knew. on a stretcher and nobody knew what the hell was going on. Yeah. I remember you introduced her and she didn't come out right away. And for like four seconds, you had a look of your face in real panic. Yeah, the show like, was live she, at the time. And yeah, that was, the, yeah. that, Britney Spears. <laughs> and then it was like one of those. And then all of a sudden she came out on a stretcher. Yeah, yeah. sometimes people don't come right out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had the best one ever was when Ralphie Mae fell down the steps. That was great, yeah. And you fell too. That, that was pretty good also. I just tripped. You stumbled. Yeah, I stumbled. But, yeah. He fell. He tumbled. Yeah, and when, yeah, what does Ralphie weigh, you think? 350? Yeah. And maybe, no, I think more than 400? that. 400? I think that's generous. It yeah. was the greatest moment of Sal's life. <laughs> <laughs> but then Ralphie May said it was it was intentional and he did it for a comedy or something. Yeah, that was not, there's no way that was, was true. There's no way it was intentional. And it, we debated that for the next nine months, I think. But As I, we fixed the stage. I, I figured out that the world is divided into two kinds of people. Yeah. People who think it's funny when someone falls and people who don't. <laughs> who feel bad for them. Yeah. Right. And it's very interesting. I think the people who don't are better people, but they're also no fun at all. And they ruin you. You know, it's just like, oh, I was enjoying that fall, but now I feel bad about it. If somehow you've surrounded yourself uh, in your life with all people who are in the camp and no. people who think it's funny. No, my wife would not think it was funny. If Seriously? Somebody felt, yeah, no, she wouldn't. Yeah, she'd feel bad for them. So maybe she's the yin to I've your surrounded yang. myself with males that with think males. it's funny okay. if somebody falls. Maybe one or two that don't, but most of the females I know would not think it was funny. So Obama comes on, you know, for about a week. Um, yeah, we knew for a week. What but there's sig- always a big chance that he's going to cancel. In fact, I think he canceled two or three times. Uh, we'd not announced it, so nobody knew. But he was set to be on our show two or three times in the past, and then something big happened, and he canceled. Would you wait, like, 24 hours before? 
Um, no, we announced hours? on Monday and okay. he was on Thursday. How much security? A lot of security. More than even usual we have at the show. Really? You know, I don't th- I've never told this, but the night Bill Clinton was on the show, we had a similar amount of security. Not as much, but there was a lot of security. And um, our security team, of course, is top, led by Guillermo. And... Um, and we had Secret Service all over the place and LAPD all over the place, and they had the dogs going through and the whole deal. So I'm in my bathroom, and I come out of my bathroom, and there's a guy in my like closet, my dressing area. And he's a young guy. I figure he's a PA on the show that I haven't met yet or an intern or something. And I said, uh, can I help you? He said, yeah, I have a CD for you. And I said, oh, it's okay. You can you can stick leave it on my desk. And then I was looking at him, and I thought, it's weird that he's he's here in my office. I have a, a, an assistant out. And I said, you know what? Actually, when you have stuff like this, just leave it with my assistant. You don't need to bring it into me. He said, I wanted this. Make sure this got to you. And I thought, okay, this guy doesn't work here. Yeah. So with everyone there, the one time someone wound up almost in my bathroom was the night President Clinton was on oh the show. Oh my God! I I'm lucky to be that. alive. They won't even let me up there, and I work for you. <laughs> I have to like get the, like, the pass ahead of time. I think that's a post. Yeah, they will only let dangerous strangers up into my area. Oh, that's good. Friends are not permitted. I would change that policy. So you got him to do mean tweets? We got him to do mean tweets. That was amazing. How'd you get him to do that? We just asked, and they said okay. We had a few ideas for him, but uh, that was one. That was what, one we were hoping he would pick, and that's the one he liked. What was the best idea that he didn't want to do? Um... You know, I'm bad at remembering things because yeah, I go through so many of these things. Yeah. If it comes to me, I'll let you know. Okay. But what was it like to interview him? It was fun. You know, it's uh, I was not nervous about it because I met him a couple times before. I did the White House yep. Correspondents' Dinner. And then about two hours before the show, I suddenly became nervous about it. And yeah. then I shot the mean tweets with him. And he has a way of... Yeah. He's very engaging. As yeah. you know. So he has, he, I felt better after chatting with him briefly. He seemed excited to be there, so that's, you know, when guests are not, or when there's a time crunch, or you know that they're there against maybe their own volition, uh, that's when I get nerve. I get stressed out, but uh, he, he's easy to interview. I was going to say, do you even still get nervous with guests? Like, you've been doing, you did like 2,200 shows. Rarely. Yeah. Every once in a while, though. It's not about the guests, necessarily. It's that you know there's going to be a lot of focus, and when you interview a president, uh, everything gets picked apart. So sports are like that in a way, too. People uh, pick it apart in ways they don't with celebrities when you have an athlete on the show. Did people pick up on Friday? Were people picking apart the interview, or did they gravitate toward the mean tweets? Um, They seem to be entirely focused on the mean tweets. Yeah. I thought that was a smart move by him. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, why yeah. not? It made him seem like kind of a regular guy. Who... But I will tell you, when, you know, we had a big list of tweets that we sent. And of course, there are a lot of mean tweets about Obama. And we sent it to his, his people, and they helped us whittle it down. And then when we got him in the chair, he looked through them, and he's like, these aren't that, these, there are many meaner, we need meaner tweets than this. But at that point, it was too late. You got in the list. Yeah. A lot of celebrities, that will happen. They'll sit down and they'll go, oh, there are meaner things than this. Why? But through publicists or whatever, it gets watered down a bit. You came to Twitter, what, did, what year did you start? 87? Yeah. You were one of the first ones. I have no idea. I don't know. It was, it was well after everyone you're else. You're like me. You go on Twitter binges. Like, you're not on it, and then all of a sudden you'll get fired up about something and get on it. But If I have got... a little bit of free time, and the other problem for me is if I have something really great, I want to save it for the show. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Um, but you, you did a PSA about the vaccination people, anti-vaccination people. Yeah, right. And, and um, some of them did not like... The thing, yeah, they, yeah. You got in the social media vortex of the hate vortex. Still, it for goes bit. on. There, you know. Listen, I feel, you know, I do feel sorry for a lot of these parents that that think vaccination caused their child's right. autism, but there seems to be no credible evidence supporting that. And uh, on top of it, I think it's a bad thing for people who are trying to figure out what does cause autism because it shifts the focus from what it should be on. And, you know, I have a daughter, and, you know, if you have the measles, there, if somebody has the measles, there's a 90% chance the people around them will become infected with the measles. It's yeah. not 
you know, it's not something where you actually have to touch somebody. So it's a uh, it's a big deal. And I was thinking about it, and you know, I, I'd heard about a couple of people in my life uh, who were debating as to whether they should vaccinate their kids, and I was yelling about them at, at them about it behind the scenes, and then I decided to say something about it. It seems like your show's starting to evolve a little bit more toward you weighing in on topics beyond just like the typical late night topics. Is I'm still fair? drawing penises on things. Well, I mean, that's good too. All the time. I'm glad you're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you're becoming a little more outspoken, which I enjoy, because that's what you're like in, in your personal life. Yeah, I guess I would say so. you're outspoken. If there's something, you have opinions on things. I do have opinions on things. If there's mm-hmm. something that moves me, I will talk about it. It's just typically it's something that is not like these receipts at CVS. You know, you buy one thing, and I mentioned this to Obama, asking him to do something about it. He seemed to think I was kidding. I was not. But you buy something at CVS or Rite Aid or one of these stores, and you get this receipt that's like um, ribbon twirling. You know, and uh, I just think it's I don't know. It makes sense to stop doing that. Yeah. Um, You're barely conscious right now. No. I'm, I'm, I'm totally Do you need conscious. an IV? I was debating whether I just wanted to turn this whole interview toward baby doll dicks and Obama Let's stories. Let's do it. What do you want to and say? And then I was like, should oh, we do yeah. it? There's no, a lot of good stuff. Because there's so many things to talk to you about, but this is the subject Sean I care Penn. the most about. Sean Penn was on the show. The whole story? So baby dolls in L.A., Coincidentally, well, I know most of you, yeah, most Quint- people know Obama's there. James the Baby Doll agent. Dixon is our uh, agent and friend. We call him Baby Doll because he calls us Baby Doll. And he has a habit of thinking that anyone he crossed paths with who's a celebrity, even if it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, will me- remember everything about that interaction. By the way, I don't know why they wouldn't because <laughs> he's just his cologne alone should be a, you know, they say the sense of smell is the strongest right. memory trigger. Okay, so th- there's a lot of backstory to this. We're going to focus on Sean Penn right now, who, by the way, watches The Bachelor regularly. I don't know if you caught that part. He asked me if I was on Team Brit or Caitlyn. No, he didn't. <laughs> yes. Sean Penn did? He, he's supporting Caitlyn. <laughs> yes, he did. Masculinity as we know it has been redefined. So um, we go out to dinner. Baby Doll pays for a dinner. When I, he also stays at my house every time he comes. So Baby Doll pays for a he dinner. He stays at your house and you like, won't even see him for the first two days. I try to get my... It, it's impossible to get any work done right. if you stay in the same room with him. But yeah, I usually do see him. Right. He kept my wife up for like three hours while she was trying to work the other night. So, um, <laughs> Baby Doll, whenever he comes into town, uh, we as a group, Cousin Sal, etc., yeah. tr- um, insist that he buy us dinner. Because usually agents buy their clients dinner. It's part of the thing. They charge it. Yeah, They charge it to think. But now he's on his own as an agent, so he doesn't want to buy us dinner anymore. Because it's his money instead of expense money. So we go to the Sunset Tower, and we arrive first, and we're sitting at the table. And um, Sean Penn and Charlize Theron are, are at the table next to us. And they're having a conversation, and I come in, I say hello to them, you know, friendly, whatever, I leave them alone. I sit down, Daniel sits down, Cousin Sal sits down, Baby Doll storms in. He's like, I know this place. I used to run with Leary, Dennis Leary. I used to run with Leary and Sean Penn here. Now, what he doesn't realize is Sean Penn. Leary and Sean Penn. (laughs) Yeah, Sean Penn is right behind him now as he's yelling his name. Yeah, Sean Penn and I, and, and, you know, of course... I go, hey, you know, he's right. He's like, oh, oh, yeah, okay, okay. You know, so now all of a sudden he's not friends with Sean Penn. (laughs) He sits down at the table. (laughs) Now, our goal, mostly my cousin Sal's goal, is to run the bill up as high as possible. Right. And the lengths that Sal goes to are amazing. Well, I was at a dinner once where the waiter refused to bring the fifth seafood tower. Yes. After he had ordered the first four, he's like, I can't do it. He actually refused you the were order. at a dinner once also where at the end of the meal at Salt's Cure, um, the waiter came around and gave everyone a $100 gift certificate <laughs> because right. Sal managed to put that on the check as well. And he also took a deer head off a wall and told him to put it on the bill. That is right. That yeah. they refused. That also happened. So, so it becomes more difficult each time we eat for Sal to run the bill up. Because well, one time you said, the last time you said, I didn't go, you sent me robes. You were all wearing robes That's in the what hotel happened. restaurant. At this, <laughs> at this particular robes. meal... That Sean Penn was at. Sal managed to. We're in a hotel. Managed to get a robe from the each from the rooms for each of us. They were two hundred and forty dollars, by the way. And so Dixon then gets the bill, and he's look. He's examining it. He puts his glasses on. He's like, "What's going on here?" He's looking around, and then he looks up, and we're all wearing robes. <laughs> 
But earlier in the evening, he was bragging about being friendly with Sean Penn, and we started busting his balls. And Sean and Charlize left, but as they left, Sal's really giving to him. He's like, let's go outside. I'll tell him. He'll, he'll confirm right now that we're friends. So they go outside to the valet, and they just miss Sean Penn. And this has become a big topic. So now, with Sean Penn coming on my show, Sal has to march Dixon into the dressing room to once and for all determine whether he knew Sean Penn or not. And, of course, Sean Penn has no memory of Dixon. He said, I barely remember Dennis Leary. He was joking. But, yeah, um, he said he didn't remember the 90s. Over and over again, Dixon's like, did you, or did you or did you not drive a Ford Mustang? And Sean Penn's like, yeah, I did. He's like, there you go. <laughs> you know, that would, to him was evidence that they were friends. Anyway, it's uncomfortable, and uh, he, Sal, uh, Dixon winds up bringing all sorts of things that he shouldn't bring up in front of these publicists. And then finally, the one of the publicists says, "This is getting uncomfortable." Even Sal is uncomfortable, which that's is, impossible. I know it seems impossible, but uh, Sal was uncomfortable, and they leave. And uh, so then Dixon turned his attentions to President Obama. Why not? He was going to force himself into that dressing room. Even though he's met Obama somewhere in the neighborhood of nine times. I mean, he's John Stewart's agent. Yep. You know, he's Stephen Colbert's agent. Obama has been in his presence many, many times. He's going to force his way in. Even though security has said he can't go in. Yep. Even though our staff has told him not to go in. He managed somehow. I don't know how it happened. And he, everyone has a story here. But he managed to get into President Obama. And do we know what happened? Um... I don't know. It's just you know. Well, he got cologne on the president. Baby That's always says that his his move is oh, we've met before, yeah. like aggressively. You know me. Yeah, you know we met. <laughs> you know who I am. The person like I, I guess did we? Meet? Yes, I, I guess I do. Yeah. yeah. So everyone was outraged, <laughs> but to me it's funny. Well, the other thing that happened was Baby sold his agency to William Morris, and Sal has become obsessed to find out to the decimal point what the price is. Not just Sal. We all are. But Sal the most. Yeah. Well, if there's anybody from William Morris Endeavor watching right now that has That's this information. That's give us the price. I would love to be, you know, listen, I'm not going to reveal my sources. I would like to know what that price is. Yeah. Sal is to the point where, what do they give the people when they're trying to get somebody to do a confession for a murder with, like, whatever, that, the... Oh, uh, truth serum? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, Sal, I think, would actually put that in Baby Doll's drink to try to find out. What I think the you have to inject is. that, but. Well, um, I think he would do that, too. I, I'm sure he would, and I'm sure he will, too. I don't think people understand how many emails in our lives are spent talking about Baby Doll. How much? I would say it's 40% of my email threads. It's not just Baby Doll. We have various, there are various little email groups uh, <laughs> where we're all mocking each other. <laughs> Daniel Kellison gets a lot of it. He Adam does. Carolla gets a lot of oh, it. Oh, especially lately. I feel like we probably get a lot of it. Oh, we definitely do. don't even know we that we get a lot it's of it. It's all these stuff for, for the best. But yeah, and sometimes somebody accidentally copies, like the other day, Sal was busting Daniel's balls for trying to hire someone through Facebook, and, um, <laughs> and he accidentally copied. Daniel on it, but then didn't care. <laughs> was, are we sure it was accidental? Uh, yeah, no, it was accidental, yeah. Well, he tried to hire a, a new assistant on Facebook and then took great umbrage that anyone made fun of him about it. And like, I got 50 recommendations. <laughs> and he probably interviewed every one of those people. He's still interviewing them. Now he's just hiring everyone through Facebook posts. Well, yeah, he likes to hire people. Well, plus Corolla is doing his Road Hard movie. Yeah. And he's been on a press tour, which is just catnip for Sal. Sal, don't, don't act like you and I aren't just as oh, interested in it. all it's, of this stuff. Yeah. yeah well, he's true. also promoting his uh, drink, Angria. You know about this? <laughs> Angry, it's Angry Mangria. <laughs> you have a few drinks and you yell at everyone. <laughs> we, I watched a Super Bowl at your house and Crow was doing a podcast. Yes. And August was saying, you got to stop by the podcast. And, oh, the, and I'm like, first of all, Crow had had probably seven drinks during the Super Bowl. So I was like, oh, this will be interesting. I want to go check it out. And I go and he's in your r recording studio. And he's in there with David Allen Greer, and both of his kids have microphones. Yes. His, his eight-year-old twins, and he was doing a podcast with his twins and David Allen Greer. If you have not heard this, I think the kids are seven, by the way. If you've okay. not heard this podcast, you really must, because I walk in, and uh, I think you'd already, you were in there for like four seconds I or something like that. I freaked out. And I start talking. And I'm confused because Adam is letting me speak, and that's not li like him at all. And I yeah. realize, oh, Adam's hammered. Yeah. <laughs> but, but his son, Sonny, is on mic. Yeah. And 
I figured Sonny was just in there for a minute and yeah. was going. But Sonny is is he's talking throughout the podcast, and yeah. of course he's seven years old, so every nothing he says has anything to do with the conversation. And so we start talking about something, and Sonny's like. I like Skittles, and you're like, oh, okay, uh, great, Sonny, you know, and it's like this weird thing you expect at a certain point Adam's going to go, all right, Sonny, uh, I'm talking yeah. to John, you know, Dad's talking to Jimmy now, but Adam yeah. is far, he's past that point. <laughs> when, I, when I was in there, Adam does the thing sometimes when he's making a point, and he just starts looking up in the ceiling, and, and it doesn't, matter. everyone could leave, and he would still be in midpoint. Yeah. And that's what he was doing but with his two kids. That would be a funny thing to do, is wait for Just Adam to, to close his eyes. And when he gets on one of those things where he's thinking and doesn't... Well, the real reason he closes his eyes, if you're making eye contact with him, yeah. you can then jump in. He doesn't want you to jump in. True. So if you can't make eye contact, he just True. turns into Gilbert Gottfried and closes his eyes. You know, that was some I, podcast, though. You know how I have uh, the Tyson Zone? which I named after Mike Tyson for when Tyson, like 12 years ago, had reached a point where you would have believed any story that was written about him. Yeah. Like, oh, Mike Tyson fought a tiger last night. Yeah. Oh, okay. I feel like Corolla's heading there. <laughs> he's, he's getting close. He just made a crowdfunded movie about a state of comedian who hates his fans. Uh, yeah, that well, was amazing. Yeah. I, he, really, I really respected that. His fans that. paid for a movie in which he tells them. It's, 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 he's on the road and they make him miserable. Kind of brilliant. The point of the I loved it. I got a and good story. I was doing podcasts with his kids. Did you get the story about him at the bar in San Francisco the other night? Yeah, but you should tell it. Okay. So um, <laughs> Adam had, uh, you know, part of this this uh, crowdfunding thing is there were meet and greets and whatever. All after the people these movies. who funded it, yeah. Right. So he had a meet and greet with a bunch of people at a bar in San Francisco after the screening. <laughs> and, and, um, and Mike August, his right-hand man, uh, who uh, allegedly works for me as well. Yeah. The evening's over. Mike runs out uh, to get the cab. Now, they're in a sports bar. And Adam is becoming increasingly agitated because they're not showing sports on television. Keep in mind, this is 1 o'clock in the morning. There's right. nothing on. But instead, they're showing 80s It's 1 o'clock in the morning on the West Coast. Exactly. There's no sports on whatsoever. Nothing happening. Yeah. Duran Duran's Rio apparently comes on for the third time, and Adam snaps. <laughs> and Mike goes to get a cab, and Adam's not coming because the, the cab's outside. And so Mike goes back in and says, hey, Adam, the cab's out here. And he sees Adam is yelling at the bartender, and the bar is dead silent as everyone listens to a, a drunken Adam Carolla yell at the bartender, telling him he, he is, he's uh, shirked his duties. He, this is a sports bar, and they're not running sports, and he's screaming at the guy because this Duran Duran video is on. For the third time. For the third time. He's lost his mind. At your birthday dinner... Mm -hmm. He was trying to make the case that John Hyatt was a better songwriter than Bruce Springsteen. He was not trying. He was... Was uh, it John Hyatt? John Hyatt, yeah. John Hyatt. He loves John Hyatt. And I, for the first half hour, thought he was talking about John Waite, <laughs> which I think hurt John Hyatt's case. I'm like, John Hyatt, the guy, did hurt, did, yeah. the guy did the Vision Quest song? Like, I, I was missing so you confused. at all? Yeah, I miss him. <laughs> that guy is... His, and then it turned out it was John Hyatt, and he really felt strongly about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's just because his wife loves Bruce Springsteen and it annoys him. Yes, that's really that's the whole thing right there. He picked the wrong guy with Springsteen. He yeah. really should he should have focused on someone else. She has her own Bruce Springsteen podcast on his podcast network. Yeah, but don't tell him he doesn't know. About oh, he, that. Yeah, he probably doesn't know about that. <laughs> So after Austin, what's next? Anything on the horizon? Death. I mean, what do you do after this? What about The Bachelor? Yeah, like somebody like Dave Jacoby over there. Yeah, feels like. We needed even more of you in the back. You had your own episode, basically. You yeah. went on a date. It's a lot. You know, it took me like three days to shoot the half of that episode I was on. It's a it lot of shooting. Three days? Yeah. I, like half of it, you were on a date. How, how long was the date? How many hours? Out of the date was only about an hour, but there, I had to get there. I had to wake him up at like 4 o'clock in the morning. I was Remember there that? all day. We then had to, we went and shot this um, like uh, obstacle course thing. Yeah. That was another day. Yeah. There was a lot going on, yeah. What would you think? What were, what were your impressions of that whole By the enterprise? Way, you must go visit the set of The Bachelor because you would be delighted beyond belief. It's like watching... It's like it's like the show Big Brother in a way in that they've got 20 monitors and yeah. they're watching all of these people all of the time. 
And there also there's a running commentary that goes on with the producers, which is pretty funny. You know, yeah. they, they hate this one. They don't, you know, whatever. This one's, you know, you get a bunch of schlubby guys criticizing the appearance of all these beautiful women. <laughs> and then there's the poor bachelor who he, you know, I mean, this guy, he genuinely came to this show because he lives in a ghost town and he needs a woman to come live with him. And that's really why he did go to... He's not looking to host a show on E. He's, you know... Right. He's looking to make a little bit of money and, most importantly, Get bring a home a wife. Right. And, um, and, you know, he's being put in all these situations with all these drunk, crazy girls. Um, and, and you seem like you had, like, a connection with him a little bit. Like, he became... He laughed basically at every joke you made. We do have a connection. I feel like he's more attracted to me than any of the women. He really show. loved being around you. He could easily <laughs> he's be a nice guy. an Andy Richter, Ed McMahon person on the couch who would laugh at every single one liner you had for the next ten years. Well, in fairness, well, in fairness, you know, he does. He's not around people much. <laughs> That's true. He took the dates to back home, and the one girl who was like turned out was in Playboy. Yeah, um, was a little freaked out by his hometown. I think she thought there was going to be more, and it's like, well, it is in Iowa. Yeah, yeah. I was not like a metropolitan. Some metro- of these women, uh, you'll find that some of these women who pose for Playboy, uh, geography is not one of their strong suits. Yeah. That was an awkward, awkward episode when she broke the news to him she'd been in Playboy. He told me off camera it was even more awkward. Oh, you know? really? Yeah. Like they wanted to shoot him watching her Playboy video, and he's like, I don't know, this is weird. I don't, you know, this is uncomfortable for me. I'm not going to do this. Because it, was, it wasn't just topless. Like, it was... The whole package. Yeah, well, to get it's Playboy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It was just a weird thing to spring on somebody. Especially, I didn't like that she waited until he had already kind of gotten to the final I don't think four. it was her decision necessarily. Oh, you think it was the producers? How yeah. much did the producers tell them, you got to keep her around another week, you just have to? Um, I don't know for sure. I wasn't involved in that. But I think there's, you know, I think there are certain people you don't want to get rid of quickly. Right. I mean, Reasons. that Ashley S. is unbelievable. Uh-huh. She got promoted to Bachelor Pack. Congratulations. Yeah, is that a promotion or uh, an incarceration? Remember? <laughs> no, it's both. Remember <laughs> you had a... What, what's that thing when you do the upfronts? Yeah. And I saw Paul Lee there, and I went right at him about how he didn't bring the Bachelor Pad back that summer, and he thought I was kidding for about five seconds, and then it gradually dawned on him I was completely serious. Well, they did... He's like, gr- what are you doing? How can you not bring this back? Now they, they did a great back. thing. They... Um, uh, the woman who ran ABC, Ann Sweeney, apparently did not like Bachelor Pad and did not right. feel like it should be on the network. Yeah. And, of course, it was popular, and, um, and they were missing it when it was gone. Yeah. So they just changed the name to Bachelor in Paradise. And that's like and people were supposed <laughs> it's to know the that same that's... show. Like, what's the difference? Of, the show's exactly the same, right? I mean, it's just them in a tropical location. Did you make your Dancing with the Stars pick? Uh, no, I haven't. I make, you make, I'll make it on... Uh, well, I probably won't because we'll be in... You're batting like 80%. Yeah. Well, you know, the truth is I'm batting like 55%, but it's they're not even money. It's, you know, I'm picking amongst 15... 12, 15 people. So, yeah. But you have a strategy, though. You look for certain things. Of course I have things. a strategy, but I have to tell you, I've won... I think I've won like maybe $20,000 betting on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> for real. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I won $8,000 last year. And we just won on Birdman. Yeah, we won on Birdman. We won $15,000. The good news is, is Sal is ready to work any bet. Make, make sure that it can happen for us. Of course. Well, that's why he's there. I yeah. sent that whole thread that day about the Oscar ads, and Sal just snapped into motion. Yeah, well, I sure. Like, hey, I don't know about boyhood. I don't think it's going to have the legs. Sal Sal's Sal's tried to talk us out of the Birdman bet. Thank goodness he didn't. I put a little extra on Selma just to be safe. You did, yeah. You won. What was the other one you won? I had, uh, well, uh, I had Keaton also. Yeah, I had Birdman and Keaton. Yeah. Yeah. Who's the best guest in Austin? Um, well, let's see. Oh, we did something fun with Matthew McConaughey. Um, we, we, uh, we tweeted, I tweeted, uh, asking a local business if you want us to make a commercial for you. Matthew McConaughey and I will make a commercial for oh, you. Oh, that's excellent. So um, we got a lot of people that asked us to do it, and we picked one. And it's a funny, I'll reveal on Monday which one it was, but it's pretty funny. It's this local business, and Matthew McConaughey and I shot a commercial for them. Are you aware of this whole subculture of kids, like, under the age of nine who don't really yes, watch I've cable or satellite oh. <laughs> anymore, like my son who's on the YouTube app? 
Put that, put that number much higher than nine, by the way. My, no, no. Kids, the, my kids, when they're at college, I was like, hey, what about uh, cable and, you know, what's, what's that cost? Like, yeah, we don't, we don't even, need it. We, we have uh, I was, computers. The way YouTube works, or at least the way he uses it, like if you watch just one of your prank videos, it comes up on some screen, but then like your next four will come up. And it just kind of never ends. If you search, like he somehow he knows how to spell your name, which is kind of a credit for him because he can't spell anything. But sometimes it's like whatever. And you put one in and it just never, and he'll just watch them for like three hours. Because you have a lot on the internet now. And yeah. little kids love seeing other little kids get super upset about stuff. Yeah. Seeing people get pranked. Yeah. And it's just now you have this whole body. Fortunately, I have the same sense of humor as a five year old. Yeah. When my son sees you next, he's going to freaking tackle you. Oh, really? You've brought them so much joy. <laughs> the one with the, uh, the I ate your Halloween candy. Like, oh, yeah. Kids that love it, that. Oh, my God. It is like the all time wheelhouse. Well, kids it's funny play. because it's really, I think it really rings a bell with kids because it's the first thing they ever earn. You know, if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, like, it's true. You're, I'm walking around, I have a bag, I'm in this costume, I'm. Asking, I'm collecting, I have it now, and then it suddenly gets snatched away from them. I have an idea because I think there's other ways to do things that appeal to him that might work in your show. One of the things is uh, weird androgynous guys talking in helium voices. <laughs> I don't he know if you want to work that in, but yeah, that's a big, big hit in our house. On Minecraft? Yeah. <laughs> something like, and then the other one is anytime somebody walks in a door and a paint bucket spills things on them. Oh, that's I like that too. Huge hit. Yeah. If you want to make that that's a franchise a for Sal. You know, that's one that. of those things that like just kind of um, just from a physical standpoint, it, it seems like it rarely works. I've done it a couple of times. I mean, oh, it works. Where it actually hits the person. That's Sal's best. That's for Sal, that would be the best way for it to go. Yeah. yeah my son does the pranks. He likes the pranks, yeah. And then just searches and stuff. One of our up. most popular pranks that we have many, many millions of views on is where we, uh, I, I, I tricked my Aunt Chippy. I told her, my cousin Mickey was pregnant, and she was having a sonogram. <laughs> yeah. And so, this, was, this was the meanest thing you've ever done. No, you don't no, think. No, I really think it was. Really? Yeah. So my I Aunt Chippy, it. who's, you know, 75 years old, has never seen a sonogram before. Yeah. It was like a big day for her. She's going with her daughter. It's like big day big for her. daughter bonding. Cigarettes in the car on the way over, the whole thing. <laughs> So um, so we set this this office up and we have, you know, my friend's wife plays the nurse and um, and she gets in there and we instead of the sonogram in in the video. And this is something that I've been planning for almost a year. I was waiting for someone to get pregnant again mm. in the sonogram video. We replaced it with video of a, a, an infant, like one of those like Ally McBeal babies <laughs> doing jumping jacks. <laughs> And like, like, look, and she, she believes the whole, she doesn't know what's going on, you know? Right. And then eventually the baby, it, it becomes twins, and she's like, what? And she's like, oh, looks like you're having twins, and they're going crazy. And then the twins' faces, my face and Cousin Sal's face, on the twins. And, um, and yeah. Then, that's when she realized. That's when she realized she'd been had, yeah. Well, not even then. It was when we, she, even when, she was still confused until we burst in dressed like doctors. There was te there were tears though. Of course there were tears. You, you edited out the tears. <laughs> yeah, I edited out the tears. It ruined everyone. Seventy five year old tears. <laughs> Comedy killer. Has she, I, mean, I told her stop crying. We need to air this. <laughs> She's like, All she right. just, does she just live her life in fear that you and Sal are going to torment her with hidden so. cameras? I hope so. I feel like that's what you've, you've we achieved. We penetrated so much of her personal life. I just, when I talk to her, I make mental notes. Like, I knew that she she's started ranting and raving about people that come to this country and don't learn to speak English. My yeah. grandparents came here from Italy and they learned to speak, you know, whatever. Yeah. So I, I make a mental note of it. I know she, uh, so then when we had her house painted orange and green while she was out at work, painted her house completely orange and green, including the shrubs and everything, I made sure that the workers who did it pretended they didn't speak any English because I knew it would make her extra crazy. Right. She cried then, too. Um, <laughs> we infiltrated her ceramics class. She's recently gotten into ceramics and um, painting these 
plates and whatever that she decorates and then gives to people. Oh, but she for didn't their think birthday. you knew about it. Or? She knew I knew about it, but she didn't know that we sent violate it. Former wrestler um, Gene <laughs> LaBelle there to pretend to be a student, and he started bragging about his nephew. He was like a city commissioner or something like that, trying to get her to start bragging about me, which she never did. <laughs> but he's smashing plates and stuff and getting her crazy everywhere she goes. We try to be there. One of my favorite things about this whole, the background of this, that Uncle Frank and Aunt Chippy used to just fight all the time, but you never, it never dawned on you how funny it was until it wasn't like Cleto over at your house and like, yeah. do you realize this is like a comedy gold mine right now? Yeah. You, you guys were so used to it, you had never stepped out oh, of I it. I hated when they would come to my house when I was a kid because they just fight and there was yelling all the time and I was like, I'd just go up to my room and right. turn the TV on and draw, you know. It was like, uh, oh, these people. But my best friend, who's now my band leader, uh, lived right across the street from me. And I told him, oh, my Uncle Frank and Aunt Chippy are coming over. He says, oh, can I come over? Which was weird, because I always went to his house. He <laughs> right. never came to my house. I said, what? He's like, oh, yeah, they're hilarious. <laughs> my sister once had a party. My parents were um, out of town for the weekend. And my sister had a huge party that got out of hand at my house. Mm. There were like 150 people at, at the house, you know, teenagers. She was in high school. And all of a sudden, my Aunt Chippy's car pulls up. She's got this station wagon, Chevy station wagon, and starts driving down the street. And everybody on the block knew this party was going on because it was getting crazy. And Cleto lived across the street, and he sees Aunt Chippy's car, and he's like, oh, my God, this is going to be great. And he <laughs> described it as this. It was like a shark coming down the street. <laughs> the car slowly pulls down the street. And she, well, it had to be slow because there were so many cars and so many kids out in front of the house. Cleto runs in the house to get a, a, a folding chair so that he could put it on his lawn so he could sit there and just watch the action. <laughs> and he said, she pulls up in front of the house. She gets out. She starts yelling. She goes in the house. And he said, I swear to God, kids' bodies start flying out the window of the house. <laughs> like a Royal Rumble. <laughs> People just start flying out the window of the house. And it was clear in about eight minutes. <laughs> well, I'm glad you've been able to capture the magic I have, that side yeah. of the family. Where, Where are we going to eat while we're here? I don't. I'm not going to be here for that much longer. But you're the you're the Prince of Austin. You yeah. know that you love the barbecue scene. You know it more than anybody. Yeah, I got a lot of good places. When did when did you like lose your mind with with barbecue? I mean, when you I always was, loved it, but when, when did I you become teeth. obsessed? <laughs> no, when did you become obsessed with like? I think it the was particulars. 1990. I was living in Seattle. I was doing morning radio, and I got a bar. And, and the house I was renting had a barbecue grill, which I had not had before. Oh. And so I went salmon fishing, and I caught a big salmon. I didn't know what to do with it, so I uh, I looked into it. We didn't have the internet. I grilled it, and that's where I really started getting into cooking and barbecue and that stuff. I don't want you to rank them here, but rank the best barbecue places, but there's a short list that you yeah. like. Yeah, well, I haven't eaten everywhere, so I don't feel comfortable. Uh, there are a few new ones that I haven't eaten at. There are a few I just haven't had a chance to, to get to yet that I'm told are great. Like, there's a place called uh, Curlin, I think is the name of it, that I haven't been to. Um, but um, top three, I won't rank them specifically, Franklin, La Barbecue, Micklethwaite. I think those are the top three. I haven't three. been to that last one. Micklethwaite, it's really good. They have very good desserts, too. And they have chicken, which they don't have at the other places. Austin has like. a lot of things that are just bad for me. Yeah, everything Barbecue here is bad makes me feel bad. A lot of people have cigarettes that are just available. Like, they, the they liquor. They smoke everything here. They Meat, smoke. It's just... Cigarettes. It's, have you been you, smoking a lot? No, I, I might have had one last night, uh, which was a mistake. One, one, five. Yeah, that's what... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you yeah. did say bad Bill was or fun Bill was here, right? Yeah, I'd say he was threatening to come out. He never yeah. came out. Yeah, you know, yeah, I've never Bill's, met him. I'd love to meet Fun that Bill. That hurts. <laughs> That's right. You totally met Fun Bill. I have. That was Fun Bill? <laughs> no, you, you met him. He's come out. I want to meet Billy. That's the guy I really haven't met. Billy? Yeah, Billy. Oh, that's what my dad calls me. That's who I want to meet, <laughs> Billy. Maybe Billy will come out tonight. He might. Billy's got an early flight tomorrow. Well, I could uh, get you some cigarettes. All right. <laughs> All right. You're uh, done? Yeah. yeah. Go do some. I will. I'm going to go do everything. talk show host stuff. Thank you very much. Congrats very on your success. You. I hope I'm you survive the trip. You. Thank uh, you. We'll be back in South by Southwest too. after this. We're in Austin. Um, couldn't resist Stephen A. Smith. Who we've, you've never come on the podcast. I was never invited, Bill. You're never in LA. I, I, it doesn't matter. I'm Look, always available for first you. First of all, you already messed up. You started off this podcast messing up. What did I say? Because you know if you had invited me to LA, that's an excuse for me to get out of Bristol to be in LA. Right, you know I'm how to jump you to that. LA. You know how to jump to that? 
in a heartbeat. Say when. I'm there. It's my fault. We LA. need like a real booker. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, we, I always book my own stuff. I was right. like, oh, I should get that. Right. right. But um, so first of all, we should talk about the fight. Sure. People expect us to talk basketball. We're going to swivel. You can talk anything, man. Um, it doesn't matter. You're going to Vegas to interview Floyd. Yes, sir. You think this is going to be the best fight since Leonard no, I, Hearns? No, no, no. I, I didn't mean it that way. What I'm saying is this is the biggest fight. From biggest a market fight. This is the biggest fight since possibly Leonard Hagler, Leonard Hearns. This is bigger uh, than anything. We See, never, I would throw, I think Tyson Douglas, I'm, I'm sorry, Tyson uh, Holyfield was yeah, that, bigger than people remember now. But you know, it was bigger because, you know what, fight number two because Holyfield beat him in number one and yep. I guess that's what I was thinking because we all thought Holyfield didn't have a shot. Yep. Styles make fight, Holyfield makes fights, Holyfield showed up, gave it to him, you know, and then fight number two came and then obviously you just, it just, everything went apart when Tyson bit his ear. You know, that just ruined everything. Cause that we was a you-remember-where-you-are moment. Oh, yes, I was. Yes, I did. I remember where I was. I remember who was in the room. That's it right. It was like, what is happening? I was in Queens, New York. There's an ear in the ground. I was in Queens, New York. I couldn't believe it. I was stunned. But the funniest part was when Don King tried to sneak into the locker room and get past Jim Gray. And Jim Gray said, hold on, hold on. Where are you going? That's the first time I've ever seen Don King try to hide from a camera. That was hysterical. So are you a lifelong boxing guy? Oh, yeah. I love my boxing, man. I love my I boxing. Because people always think, like, oh, basketball guy and other sports. But nah, I can tell all. from the way you're talking about it. I love it. boxing. Uh, I saw... Who is your guy? Everyone Muhammad, has a guy. Muhammad Ali. He's the greatest. I mean, but it was more so because of, you know, obviously the social and political issues he was willing to tackle. He was yep. more than just a fighter. Um, and he meant so much to us within the black community. And because of that and how he resonated with all of us, that's what made him the greatest, which is why none of us have ever called him anything else. See, I had, so I was born in 69. Mm -hmm. So my first Ali experience was basically like wide world of sports, like right, right around this third Frazier fight. Yeah. But then kind of the, the steady decline, but then the comeback with Spinks. Yep. But I, like Leonard became my guy. Yeah. Starting the Olympics, 76. Yeah all the way through and I basically watched every Leonard fight and he had the contract back in those days every fight was on yep. and just kind of followed but him all the way through but when did Leonard become your guy see for me seven in Montreal yeah because yeah. exactly when you, you, because for me it was when he lost to Roberto Duran and then came back for fight number two and it was the Nomas fight I almost that's cried when, when he lost the first one really that was closed circuit remember yes, the days of right. closed circuit that's right and what really got me, I hated Duran so much. And then right after the fight, Leonard came in for that little hand tap. And Duran just, like, mugged him and walked away. And, yep. And I was just like, oh, he's, he has to beat this person. That's right. And then but he beat he was, him. He was hands of stone. And, you know, Leonard taught us something that night that I think resonates with all, it should resonate with all sports fans from that moment forward. The power of the mind. Because mm. Duran was the hands of stone. And I saw Leonard hit this dude, never stunned him, yep. never hurt him, nothing. So how is he going to beat this guy who despises Ray Leonard and is going to keep coming? Well, how do you beat him? You make him miss and you taunt him and you embarrass him and you just demoralize him and make him into a mental midget. That's what Ray Leonard did. And that was the first time I ever watched sports and said, wow, this is what you can do to a guy that you can't hurt physically. Right. You could destroy him mentally. And I think part of that first fight with Leonard was just... Trying, he, oh, you're the pretty boy. Oh, mm -hmm. you can't be in a war. Right. Oh, and he was like, oh, you want to, oh, I'm going to be in a war. That's right. But it actually wasn't the right strategy. No, and then he figured it out. Wasn't. So you, you think Manny's going to give Floyd a fight? Because I am in the corner of Floyd's going to just, it's, this isn't even going to be close. I think People Floyd's going to stupid. I think Floyd's going to give him a boxing lesson. Me I love too. Manny Pacquiao. I think he's a sensational fighter. I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but he's not the boxer that Floyd Mayweather is. Floyd Mayweather is a magician in the ring, and yeah. I expect him to pick Manny, out, Manny Pacquiao apart. And matter of fact, I expect him to stop Manny Pacquiao in about 11 rounds. Yeah, I'm thinking like somewhere between 9 and 11. He's got a 5-inch reach advantage. He's got about a 2-inch height advantage. Um, and if you want to see how they look next to each other, think Floyd Mayweather Jr. versus Juan Manuel Marquez and how they looked going up against one another when Floyd beat him. Dropped him in the second round, but it ultimately went to decision. Wouldn't surprise me if this went to decision. I just see a different Floyd right was now. Was that before Marquez changed his yes. training? Yes. Yes, it is. That was it's before. Training? No comment beyond that. Training? But that, that. That definitely was before well, he changed I think, his training. I think Floyd right. would have beaten him four years ago. Yeah. 
And since then, Manny got absolutely knocked out cold. That's right. Cold well, cocked. Bob Marquez. Cold cocked. Out for a minute. And I just don't think you're ever the same when that happens. But that's what Bernard Hopkins told me. He said it takes you like 10 fights, maybe 10 years to recover from a blow like that. Yeah. And even though he's won, you know, since that time, the reality is, is that, again, you know, he only knows one way to fight. And he's going to continue to come at Floyd. But the flip side is he's talked so much smack. He's gotten involved with Roach and yeah. Aram. We're talking so much junk to Floyd. The boxer that Floyd is, I don't know Floyd on any kind of personal level uh, outside of boxing, but the boxer that I know, I've seen this guy, and he's so serious right now. It's like he's looking at Manny like, do you know what you've gotten yourself into? There's a reason Floyd's never lost, yeah. Exactly. Floyd is, exactly. I would say, one of the great athletes we've seen yeah. and is his own worst enemy in a lot of ways That's right. with the public. Where do well, you stand he, on him as like a person? Because he's so well, polarizing in so many ways. Here's the deal. You hear the stuff about him and women, nobody can support that. Nobody, you know, I've seen Michelle Beadle and others, yeah, yeah. And, you know, here. And obviously we had our differences with the old Ray Wright scandal. Yep. But the thing about it is, is that you can't applaud that as a guy. Now, Floyd has never spoken to me about it, according to him and his team. They're not really allowed to get into it. You never know what the legal system, what time of step you got to go through. But that's just not the right image to have. And I think that he knows that. Um, but well, you, also the way he treats the people in his camp. And, like, well, the thing about it is so, I'm around a lot. I'm, I've been around a lot of his boys and stuff like that, a lot of the people that work for him. Yep. And his attitude is, I'm paying you, I'm the boss. But then you have to lean towards what your environment is. Mm. If it's you, if it's me, my parents are alive, they raised me, a lot of stuff that I went through, I, I know right from wrong. Well, if you look at him and the history that he has with his father, you can understand how he might come across as a bit cantankerous sometimes. You can understand how he might come across as a bit abrasive or a bit defensive or inclined to or to be fixated on having authority yeah. and being the boss. If you understand his background, and then you see the way that he acts. Look at the way he acts with Bob Arum. Yeah, you might not like the guy, but at the same time, it could be just about business. I'm going from you. Now I run my own shop, and that is that. But if you talk to Floyd enough, it seems like he despises this man. Well, why is that? Mm. Then you have to piggyback. If you walk around with that level of animosity towards another human being that really has no dominion over your life whatsoever, why would that be? Where does that come from? Sometimes, certainly not most of the time or all of the time, because sometimes it could be just an excuse. But sometimes you got to ask yourself the question about somebody's roots and where they come from and where does this personality originate from in order to get inside who they are. Because sometimes that helps you understand them a little bit better than you normally would. And I think with Frazier, Ali pushed him to the point that he, like, genuinely hated Frazier. Exactly. Uh, Ali. And he hated him basically, you know, all the way through the, this decade. Listen, we love he Ali. He never let it up. That's right. We love Ali. He Ali was, was great. brutal He was the Frazier. greatest. But there is no denying that Joe Frazier's, d d you know, his feelings about Muhammad Ali were justified. If yes. you saw the things that Ali said about him, and maybe Ali was just promoting it or whatever, but being a black man and yeah. understanding the things that Ali said about him and how that could resonate. Man, let me tell you something right now. You've got, I, I, listen, I know people who have been killed for saying some of the things that Ali said to Joe right. Frazier. You understand? So you just understand that there's just certain places that you can't go with people. And when you are a black man, and somebody, particularly in the 70s, mind you, somebody calls you an Uncle Tom, a house you know what. and the you know, the gorilla dog. Man, yeah. uh, look, boy, I mean, that's, there isn't a black person alive that can't understand. Well, he also, he was is. doing all that, but then he was also painting himself as like, if you wrote for Frazier, that means you stand for this. That's right. And if you root for me, you stand for this. That's right. That's right. Which was a whole other unfair subplot for that. That's whole true. Thing. That's it's true. It's weird. I, I loved Ali so much as a kid. And then I, when all the stuff came out, Ghost of Manila, stuff like that, mm -hmm. and Frazier became this belatedly sympathetic figure, mm -hmm. it was really interesting. It was just interesting how that tilted a little bit. And uh, I'm sure Ali must 
at some point in his life must have regretted maybe I, I, pushing I, well, it too far. I, from, from what I'm told, he definitely had some regrets about that. He thought it was marketing. He also, you know, his his affiliation, obviously, with the Nation of Islam, yeah. the sign of those times. Uh, that's what it meant. I mean, you looked at the other fo- you look at other folks outside of the black community as the enemy. We've evolved as a society, but what we have to, I think that when you think about it from a white black standpoint, what white America has to accept is the fact that you too have evolved for the better. That you too are much better now than you were then. Right. And so because of the the you know the transformation that has taken place, we've all changed. We've all grown. We've all evolved. And things that are absolutely positively not acceptable now were totally acceptable then because you understood that there was one side and there was the other side. Yes, the Civil Rights Legislation, Civil, Civil Rights Act may have been passed in 1964, Voting Rights Act 1965, and subtly as a society, we may have evolved. But in reality, when you walk the streets as a black man and you had to deal with the kind of stuff Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali had to deal with, Joe Frazier is sitting there like, look, man, I got to deal with the same thing that you do. I'm yeah. just not a Muslim. I'm a Christian. So because I'm this way and I'm from the South and all of this other stuff, I don't have the history, even though Ali was from Louisville, I don't have the same feelings that you have because I'm not a member of the nation. And Ali didn't appear sensitive to that. And as a result, putting that spotlight on Frazier, it wasn't just Ali's words and Ali saying that about Frazier. Ali was inciting others to do so as well. And that's where the hatred can brew. When you walk in the streets and you know, you got other brothers and sisters in your own community looking at you in the same fashion that Ali is looking at you and you're able to say it's because of Ali, then it justified the hatred. We understand a different side of Ali because Ali was fighting the system, the man and all of this other stuff. But in terms of Ali Frazier, there isn't a black person alive that can't understand how Frazier felt. I wanted to ask about how you've changed on TV over the last 10 years Mm -hmm. because it seems like there's like a thoughtfulness that I think was always there, Mm -hmm. but now you're not afraid to get there Mm -hmm. on TV. Maybe 10 years ago, it was a little more bombastic and Mm -hmm. a little more in your face, stuff like that. I remember the first episode you did with your show, Mm -hmm. you had Iverson on. I thought that was one of the best hours in the history of TV. I'd never seen Iverson like that. And so it was... It was there, and now it just seems like you're comfortable with it. Is that fair to say? I mean, I'm watching this from afar. Well, number one, I'm more established, accomplished, whatever words you want to use. I'm comfortable in my own skin. But more importantly, I've learned to be me. And, you know, in the process of being me, well, who am I? Who's the person that raised me? For example... I'm a black person that touches on racial issues from time to time. <laughs> black, you have a lot of white folks that are run out there like, you know, it's a racist guy, blah, blah, blah. And I just laugh and I shrug it off. Before, I would be defensive. Right. Now, I'm revealing. You know why? Because I happen to have, my grandmother was white. My mother's from a mixed marriage. Yeah. So somebody sitting there and saying something like that about me actually makes me laugh now because I'm like, you don't know my history. You yeah. don't know my back. You don't understand that I have white cousins. I have, you know, I have white relatives. Yeah. This is part of my family. It's part of my heritage of who I am. So we throw that out the way. Then we sit in and we say, well, Stephen A., is it necessary to be honest? Well, if you're informed enough so to make a cogent opinion, then what's wrong with that? What's wrong? Why do we have to all fall in line and be predictable? Then they get into, well, you know what? You must have a problem or, you know, why don't you speak out against this person or that person? I'm, I'm of the mindset, look, man, Bill Simmons gets his. I'm happy for him. I don't want you affecting my wallet. Trust me, I want to get paid too. But it doesn't mean I don't want you to get paid. It doesn't mean I don't want Jalen Rose to get paid. It doesn't mean that I don't want anybody else to do anything. And when you recognize that about yourself and you see the way society has devolved, all of a sudden, you know that you're above the fray and it builds a level of fearlessness that you don't have to concern yourself with too much of anything. I know that I'm a fair-minded individual. I know that I call it like I see it. If I feel uh, something as a black person, I'm unapologetic about it. But there are also things that I feel in favor of those who are not black. And I'm speaking out against somebody black. How come no one says anything then? So when you look at it from that perspective and you're able to deal with something as, as risque, for lack of a better word, as that, 
it ultimately lends itself towards you being fearless about most things. And it falls in line with who I am because the one thing that I strive constantly to be is authentic. I'm not saying that I'm always right. I'm not saying you're always going to like what I say, but I do pride myself in being fair minded. I do pride myself in being as informed as I possibly can be. And I pride myself in being a God fearing, decent human being. I don't believe, you know, that anybody should you should walk around wanting any any negativity for anybody. I kind, I'm the kind of person that believes that that really tears away at your spirit. But if you do something negative and this is my job to call you on it, then so be it. I don't want any basketball player to fail. But if you shoot one for 20, what exactly is it that you expect me to say? I'm not rooting for you to shoot one for 20, but I do have an obligation to say so when you do. And when you understand that there's a dichotomy that exists between those two positions, it's easier to move forward. And that's what's happened to me. It's just been easier for me to move forward. Well, I mean, your television marriage with Skip, mm -hmm. I think people think he's too negative sometimes. Yeah. And you just said you didn't like that. But you're also friends with him and you have a great relationship with him. When he gets too negative on stuff, do you tell him or depends, do you disagree to it disagree? Depends, it depends on when I disagree. If I disagree with him, I tell him. If I agree with him, I tell him. Everybody has the right to be themselves. There isn't a single solitary individual that I know of that doesn't make mistakes or that doesn't have positions that somebody may disagree with. But at the end of the day, if I'm able to look at you and say the core of who you are and what you stand for is decent, I'm good with you. I know how, as, as, as our President Obama would say, there's a difference between disagreeing and being disagreeable. And you got to understand the difference and totally be okay with that. There are some things that I've seen that I didn't like. You know, I remember when Michelle Beadle sat here with you and you asked her about what she had said about me with the whole Ray Rice fiasco. I don't run from those topics. My, my issue was, is attack me all day long for misspeaking, but don't treat me like I'm Ray Rice and I put my hands on a right. woman because I've never put my hands on a woman. Right. I didn't do that. So let's understand the difference, you know, as opposed to going off as if I'm guilty of such a thing, because now we're going into a different realm. We're touching on my character. Do you know anything about my character? Do you know anything about my history? Because I would certainly never go that far with another colleague. I would not, certainly never go that far with another human being. They, there are people that talk smack about Bill Simmons all day long. And they get shocked. I'm like, I like Bill. I'm wrong with Bill. What do he do? You know, well, could you believe what he said? He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Actually, he does know what he's talking about. You just happen to disagree with his position. Right. But you can't say he doesn't know what he's talking about. Why are you trying to create some schism or some divide? He's my colleague. I respect the hell out of him. He does a hell of a job. Yeah, we for get us. along. I think Whatever. people are surprised. Yeah, by that. They, they are very surprised. <laughs> I'm like, we get along. Why would I not get along? Well, I'm, always, I'm fascinated by your show because mm -hmm. it's you guys are on a tightrope. Mm -hmm. You're on for ten hours a week. Yep. You are trying to push the envelope with topics mm -hmm. and you know have good arguments and try to craft certain things toward big picture statements right. and all that kind of stuff. Right. And you're on live TV. Mm -hmm. And this is an era where you could bat 499 for 500 with your points. Yep. And you want to get as close to the line as possible sometimes mm -hmm. with what you're doing. But that 500 time you go over, and that's the time when everybody goes nuts. Yeah. And you have no safety net. Now you're falling off the tightrope, and that's it. There's no dead underneath it. Yep. I don't know if I could do that show. Sometimes we don't either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, sometimes it gets pretty hard, but, but at the same time, Understand something about Skip and I. First of all, we only ask ourselves, do we want to discuss this topic? We genuinely, honestly don't know what the other is going to say until 10 o'clock. You don't want to know. We don't want to know. See, I, I hate know, that with TV. I don't want to ever know I, what people are going to do. I'm the kind of person that yeah. I don't want to know until we are on the air. Because I want to react over or towards it just like we're having a natural conversation. Because I think when you don't do that, it comes across as choreographed and the audience can see it and all of a sudden the authenticity of what you're bringing to the table is gone. That's how most and, studio and, shows do it, yeah, though. Yeah, well, I may, not, may or may not be speaking from experience. That's not, that's not, that's not me. Sometimes you leave the show in the meeting, yes, right? and then you go, and now it's just you rehearsing a play. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's going to say the part right. about Dwight, and now he's going to say Kobe, and then I come in and say this. But as talent, sometimes that's on you. I mean, don't get me wrong, they ask. 
They just got tired of asking because I never listened. Yeah. You'll find out when I get on the air. Right. I'll give some generic point, but then when I go on the air, you consistently see me see, going in a different direction. But that's TV. Direction. I love that, though. That's what I'm saying. I didn't tell you what we were going to talk about when we did the podcast. Not at all. And I didn't ask. I love winging it. And I didn't ask. Yeah. Because that's how I like it. Because to me, for people to see us conversing, they need to feel how authentic it really is. Yeah. I think that's incredibly important. You know, and that's the, that's how it goes. I trust that you're not going to disrespect me. You trust that I'm not going to disrespect you. As long as we understand those lines, what's there to be concerned about? Was there ever a time you did first take, you're in the middle of the segment, you're talking, and you said, uh-oh, we just crossed some invisible line and I know it, but now we're on live TV and we're finishing the segment. But well, yeah. I know stuff's going to happen. That was, that was when I used the word provoke. That was exactly what So you happened. knew even in the moment. You're well, like, in, in, in the moment, because what happened was, here's the story. Two of my sisters were victims of domestic violence. And in the past, it's about 20 years ago, they were both the victims of domestic violence. And I remember one time, my sister, her boyfriend, because she had stayed with him, and she had kept going back to him at that time. And I'm only telling the story because she gave me permission to tell it. What happened is, is that after the fact, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So what happened is she he was laying in the bed. Nobody was home but her and him. And he was asleep. And she was so furious at how he had been treating her that she threw hot water on him. Well, what do you think he did when he got up? So my point is, yes, he's wrong. And he was wrong for doing all of those things that he did to you, sis. But why would you do that when nobody's around to make sure that he doesn't retaliate and do something to you? Because nobody was around. So in the midst of talking about that, I that was about to tell that, that story was in my head. But then I instantly remembered I didn't check with my sister to get permission to tell her so business. To stop the story. So I stopped the story. And that was when that word came out of my mouth. And when the word came out of my mouth and I saw the way it was misconstrued on Twitter in a matter of minutes, I knew there was going to be trouble. And it was just that simple. And, I mean, you get the other side of it, though. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, absolutely. You know, you don't you can't have anybody out there thinking that a woman provokes some dude putting his hands on her. Right. You, that's unacceptable. That's right. unacceptable. I, don't give, I don't give a damn what happens. You walk away. You don't do that. But I was trying to tell that story, and that's how the misuse of the word came into play. No one asked, and that was unfortunate. People just jumped all over me. That was unfortunate. But that goes back but to the tightrope thing, though. That's right. That's that tightrope thing. And so you understand. I heard it, it. and I, it obviously, you know, yeah. I mean, I was like, man, I can't believe you said that. Yeah. And then I just figured there must have been some sort of backstory that I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. But it was my job to make sure that if I was going to open my mouth and say such a thing, yep. I should have told the story. But I didn't because I well, had to check with my sister. And I didn't know that the, the subject matter was going there. See, we were going to talk Ray Rice, but I didn't know it was going there. So, again, we're talking live television. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no you're on for 10 hours a week, yeah, and exactly. Ray Rice is the biggest exactly. topic for yes. a month. Exactly. I mean, for me, it's like I feel like it's not even worth it to even if, – if I'm talking in a way where it's just being transmitted yeah. live yeah. and that's a topic, mm -hmm. I'm out. I don't right. want any part of it. That's right. Because um, I don't think it's worth it. Well, it's a, but but see, that's where I'm different than you. I know. You're different Because I love addressing dicey issues. It doesn't scare me. You know, to me, that's part of my job. That's part of what makes me me. For you to well, know. I like, I like I'm not some of it, it, but that's like, I don't no, know. I agree. No, I respect that. But I'm just saying that for me, when you're talking to me, I want you to know that I'm, I'm as real as I can be and I'm as authentic as I can possibly be. I'm not going to always be right. I'm yeah. open for correction. I often use the, 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 the phrase, I've never lost a debate in my life. Why? <laughs> because either I win or when I lose, it's because somebody educated me about something I didn't know. So I win anyway because now I walk away more informed than when I started. Either way, I win that way. So to me, any subject is worth broaching. When I touch on issues of race, all I'm trying to do half the time, most of the time, is give people my perspective or the perspective of a community of a community that you may not otherwise hear from. Then I encourage people to do their time. People don't hear me sitting there and telling black folks all the time, can't be sensitive. 
If you want to speak and say what you feel, then other people have a right to say what they feel. Let's listen because that's how we're going to evolve and get along. If I listen to people sit there and say, well, Bill Simmons was this way and Jalen Rose is that way, then I wouldn't be cool with both of them. But I don't do that. I sit there and I got to know Bill Simmons and I talk to him and I talk to Jalen Rose and I got to know him. So I will judge that for myself. I'm not going to let anybody define what somebody else means to me. You do that on your own because to do otherwise is purely lazy. What was the thing you said about an athlete in the moment that you came to regret the most? An opinion you had, something that changed your opinion belatedly or you're just like, man, I just missed that one. I, I, I'm cognizant of using the word choke. One of the reasons yeah. that I, I'm, I'm, I'm very protective of that is that, you know what I learned? You're not choking if you just have an inability to do something. Like, I remember when LeBron James missed two free throws a few weeks ago against Houston on a Sunday yeah. afternoon. Everybody was going off. You know what I said? What's the problem? I've seen LeBron miss plenty of free throws. He ain't Ray Allen. He ain't Steve Nash going to the free throw yeah. line. He's LeBron. He he's in, he's he's in the set. Four yeah, 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 he might make four or five, but most of the time it's, 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 it's less. It's, it's, it's more towards 75. Sometimes in his career it's been 73. You know, I look at it from the perspective that whatever your gift is, if you're doing something great and then all of a sudden the pressurized moments arrive when palms get sweaty and behinds get tight, that's when I'm looking at you as choking. But if you're doing something that you customarily do no matter what, to me that's just your ability or lack thereof that's not choking to me and i'm cognizant of that isn't it fair to say lebron didn't look right the first two months no he didn't he did he looked weak that paleo diet or whatever he was on he was playing um, below the rim yeah he he didn't look like himself but those two weeks off in south beach clearly helped him no question R and R. That's why I can't vote for him for MVP, though. <laughs> yeah, I agree Doesn't with you. MVP, the MVP can't go on a vacation no, for two weeks. He can't go on vacation for two weeks. I, I think that Steph Curry, James Harden, what he's been able to do without Houston, Russell Westbrook, the way he's carried Oklahoma City as of late. Davis is the, in the, there. The, the Davis bit. is in there. Yeah, they got to make the playoffs, though. But, the playoffs. but Anthony Davis is big time. Uh, but those would be the guys. It wouldn't be LeBron this year. But he is playing on another level. Are you uh, have to be on the best team MVP guy? No. Or are you uh, just who had the best season guy? Well, it's not just, it's neither. You have to make the playoffs. I can't give you the MVP if you're on the outside looking in the postseason. In baseball, I can see it, but not in basketball. If you don't you make five that's guys right. in the court, basketball. Totally agree with you. Yeah. If you are, if you make the playoffs, however, then you all, you're in the mix. Now I'm looking at your abilities and how you got there. Yeah, I'm thinking, I think Harden's been the most valuable. So far, Just because if you pulled him off that team, I don't know what they have. Yeah, that's true. But then when you look at the way he's played over the last week and well, you look now at the way Russell Westbrook, he's yeah. starting to drift. And so if Russell Westbrook, obviously we're not talking about his recent performance against Chris Paul and the Clippers, but if Ooh. Russell Westbrook continues to play the way he's been playing and Oklahoma City makes the playoffs, I don't know how he could be denied. But, but, if, but if Golden State wins 68 games, Curry's going to win the MVP. Well, I was getting ready to go yeah. there. I'm saying that if... James Harden tails off, and Russell Westbrook's a roller coaster. Curry then you give it. it. Then Kerry gets it. Then Curry I, gets I think it. he gets it anyway. If it's sixty-seven, if they're sixty-seven and fifteen or something, that's true. That's true. History says that's the true. best guy in that team is going to win the MVP if he had a good enough season. And he did. His You're stats right. were great. Um, right. Westbrook, though, I mean this Durant thing. Mm -hmm. Look, th breaks his foot. They said six to eight weeks. Comes back in six. Never totally looks right. He doesn't look right. They have to take the screw out and put it. It's going to be, we're going to reevaluate in a week. Then it's another week. Yeah. Now he's going to be back, we think, in yep. one or two weeks. It's mm -hmm. like, I don't like any of this. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. But I, I will say this to you. You need two superstars or you need a star, a superstar and a star to win a championship. I understand Detroit didn't have to do it when they beat the Lakers back in 2004. There was no superstar on their squad. But that was an aberration. You got a guy like Russell Westbrook. Don't think for one second that you could live without Kevin Durant and win the chip. That's not going to happen. Can we talk about that 04 Pistons for a second? Yeah. Because that's the go-to example everyone brings up. Mm -hmm. As you said, not only was that an aberration, I, I think it, it was a mega aberration. Because mm -hmm. think all the stuff that they had going on that yeah. year. He had the weird Peyton Malone thing. Mm -hmm. It was basically a four-man team. They gutted their bench. Right. Malone got hurt at the worst possible time, mm -hmm. which nobody remembers. Yep. Kobe had all of his stuff coming up. Him and Shaq weren't talking. Well, that's what, that was the whole thing. I mean, it I was mean, like that. It was, it was too much friction. The Lakers were a soap opera, and that's what did them in. And it, they it just was, folded. When they it just, got to the point to folded. fold, they were ready, and they, they folded. They just, there's no way on earth they should have lost. 
To me, that was like a Tyson Douglas type thing. I agree with you. Tyson in Japan was ready to lose to somebody. And it happened to be Buster Douglas who just put everything together for 10 rounds. I was in court side and I watched Kobe look away from Shaq when Shaq had 17 and nine in the first half, had Ben Wallace on his backside, demanded the ball, was as aggressive as he had been all season. Is it game four? I believe it was game four. Yes, it was. 36 and and 20. And Kobe just looked away from him and threw the ball in another direction. And I looked at at one of my colleagues on press row that day and I said, it's it's over. over. So you have to go. You have to catch a plane. Yeah. Um, I'm officially inviting you to L.A. Consider it done. Let's right. make it happen. South by Southwest, more from Austin coming up. Thanks to Stephen A. Mm-hmm. We're in Austin for South by Southwest. I don't know how this podcast hasn't happened yet. I don't either. We've circled it for years. Dude, we're, we're cross country right now. It was never the right time of our lives. <laughs> There's, you don't know how many people have said that to me. <laughs> we just couldn't, just the past couldn't cross. Mm-hmm. And then I was going to come on your you show were. and that never worked out either. Nothing ever works Timing, out with us. Timing, that kind of thing. But Rachel here Nichols, we are. my former colleague. Yes. Now not my former co- now not my colleague. That's true. <laughs> you have an excellent grasp of the dictionary. But I still feel like you're co- my colleague because when you yeah. uh, when you went after Goodell in we're the press colli- conference, we're collegial. Yeah, when you went after Goodell, I was so happy. I went after it delighted me. an idea. Yes. I don't love that construction of I went after Goodell because that that takes it down a notch from what I think was more important than that. Yeah, but I've never been about the truth. It's not about petty. I understand. <laughs> 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 Look, that was a time, and then in the time since then. We want answers. And this Mm. is something I feel really strongly about. The NFL has worked very hard to insinuate itself into every aspect of American life. Yes. It used to be kind of just a professional sports league. It is no longer just a professional sports league, right? It is part of America. Mm. And we see they put out the stat that 80% of Americans watched an NFL game last year. That's amazing. You can't get 80% of Americans to do anything. Yeah. Certainly can't get them to vote. People who like church can't get them to go to church. You can't get them to watch the same TV shows. You can't get them to read the same newspapers. 80% of Americans watched at least one NFL game last year. So this is the place, like it or not, where we all come together, where we actually care about the same thing. And it is okay to hold that game and that league to a higher standard because they asked for it. They're the ones who sponsored the cereal we eat and every other part of you know, designing cartoons for our kids to watch and trying to get fans who are two years old and fans who are 80 years old to come under their tent. Well, now that we're all in that tent, it better be a nice tent. And by the way, nobody's asking for anything so special. Don't hit women and don't beat children. These are not like high moral ground that somebody's trying to stand on. Don't pretend you don't know about evidence that you might not know about and Absolutely. a whole bunch of stuff. Don't lie to all of us if we know, yeah. if we're smart enough to see what's in front of us. So, and the pattern of behavior of how you've handled previous things in the past compared to how you're handling this situation I, when I, it doesn't match up, so, that doesn't so, help. Yeah, so asking about all of those things, I always get frustrated when people reduce it to like, oh, she said this and he said that, because I think it's actually a lot more important than that. Okay, so when you went after Goodell, <laughs> now it's this press conference, everybody's just lobbing softballs at him. Yes. And then well, you stood no, up no. and you did not have a softball for him. No. And people loved it. So then the second press conference he did at the Super Bowl, it, it seemed like he had something ready for you. Like he had a little extra snark. He went into his he little snark, snark basket and pulled some snark out for you. It seemed, and it didn't even work. No, it, it didn't. It seemed to me like a missed opportunity. Mm. Right? Here was your chance to learn from what was, by all accounts, a pretty disastrous press conference the first time around. And and not just vis-a-vis me, but in general, right? After Goodell walked off the podium from that first press conference back in the fall, it's not like he got good reviews. People weren't saying, oh, well, he really knows how to handle a crisis, right? So here was his next most public appearance after that. He'd obviously done a lot of stuff in between, but this was the most national stage Mm -hmm. event that he had been to since then. And you would think that maybe someone in that, in that circumstance or that the NFL at large would want to go out of its way to do sort of the opposite of what it had been criticized for before. That didn't happen. And that, to me, is a missed opportunity. What kind of feedback do you get? You know, do you even care? 
Yeah, I, I don't. I, I'm. I'm actually looking for the answer to the question. Well, you're on social, like you. you I am. You're out there. I like social media. I yeah. like. You know, it's funny. I we we just had. We were just talking to Charles Barkley. Yeah. Charles is here at South by Southwest doing a panel. Uh, How I remain relevant without the use of social media. Right. And I believe uh, Twitter is stupid was one of the things that yeah. came out of his panel. Twitter so, makes you dumber. Right. Yeah. Something like that. Um, I love Charles, but I don't agree with that. I love the conversation on social media, and I love how it relates to sports because I think it has opened up our accessibility to athletes and the games that we love and all of that stuff. So I think that's good. I don't pay a ton of attention, good or bad, to what people think of the job I am doing because I'm pretty confident in the job I'm doing. Right. And you don't really need the feedback from people who have, like, weird numbers and right. names in their Twitter <laughs> handles and all that I stuff. I mean, look, it's nice when people say nice things about you, but I, I'd love them to be... And, and what I liked about a lot of the reaction to a lot of the conversation that a lot of journalists had around the NFL in the last six months is it seemed like a lot of fans believed in the overall quest for truth and the overall quest for them to do it better. There was plenty of radio hot takes, but a lot of it was about, hey, we want them to do better. And a lot of the feedback to me was, hey, you're holding them accountable. And, and I like that because I think that we should all want that. It makes your, one of the jobs you have is you, you work the NBA. And you're mm -hmm. kind of floating in and out of huddles and pass along information. Mm -hmm. And how you use Twitter actually is, it seems like it weirdly, it complements yeah. what you're doing on TV. It's like, oh, I didn't get to get this in, or I just heard this. It's going to, this information has a shelf life of 10 minutes. I'm going to fire it out. I used you as an example recently in during a, a, something I was speaking at because I feel like the internet in general, whether it's columns on the web, podcasts, whether it's Twitter, social media, it's, of course, lowered the barrier to entry, right? Yeah. Used to be you had to get hired by the newspaper. First of all, the newspaper had to find printing presses. Someone had to pay to print the newspaper. That was how you got yourself out there, a magazine in terms of writing. Or you had to buy a radio tower, or you had to own a television studio and the cameras and the or crews to paper. go at it or yeah. something like that. Well, with the Internet, you can start writing in Boston and just saying what you think, and people can find it and read it. And then it evolves into the podcast and evolves into everything we have today. Same with Twitter and social media. Mm -hmm. well, on a tiny, small scale, that's what I can do during a game. Yep. I can't get in everything that I report onto the broadcast. And I don't even put all of it on social media because, frankly, I was at the Spurs-Cavs game last night. And, yes, a lot of people were watching that game, but a lot of people who follow me couldn't care less about that game. So I try to meet it out so they're not getting three straight hours of every yeah. little detail of Kevin Love's you know, fingernail or whatever. But, but, yeah, it's a great way to get out little bits of information that there's too high a barrier for entry on TV because I'm at that game with Kevin Harlan and Charles Barkley and Chris Weber, which is great. I mean, there yep. are no three guys you'd, you'd want to watch a game with. But, they, you know, Charles has a lot to say. So I'm not always getting the word in edgewise. I can get it on social media. How about the height differential with some of the NBA players you have to talk it's to? It's brutal, man. I'm five foot four. Yeah. I have a sneaky rule. So they gotta lean down. No, here's my sneaky rule. You can look for this if you if you care to. I would. I, would, so I do care. I have a one foot rule. If you are taller than six four, so if you're taller than a foot over me, and I can, I will bring that player over to the scores table for the post game interview, so that he can lean against the scores table. We can sit his put his butt against it and take That's a good really like eight inches off of his height. Wow. Otherwise, I have no shot. Now, I get screwed when it's like I'm interviewing Kevin McHale at the quarter. There's nowhere to go. Yeah, what do you do with that? And he's tall. So, yeah, sometimes it looks ridiculous. I look like I'm, like, from a smaller alien race next to, like, these guys. It doesn't look normal. But. So you're always rooting for a situation where, like, Kyrie Irving does really well. I'm psyched about guards playing yeah. well. Come on, it's guards. Like, awesome. Go, guards. <laughs> do it, guards. Exactly. Run more awesome. plays for them. I had to interview Nate Robinson after, like, he was the only player oh, left standing great. during the, like, Bulls. Remember yeah. the Bulls net series? Oh, yeah. Where, like, every member of the Chicago Bulls was in some sort of terrible disarray. Lil Dang was in the hospital. Derek Rose was, mm. of course, injured. I mean, they had, like, you know, Nate Robinson was throwing up on the side of the bench, like a good yeah. foot for me, but then still had the heroic game. So I'm interviewing him. I, that was, that might have been my happiest moment, getting interviewed with someone I could go like this to. Mm. Your background was newspapers, right? Yes. Yeah, Which hardcore. Is, I majored in... Nowadays, I don't think people have the, the uh, career path that you took. Certainly. They're, they're, I mean, there's certainly people who go from newspapers to TV, but I, w I was pretty hardcore in newspapers. Right. So I majored in journalism at Northwestern. 
And they have... Oh, another Northwestern one? I know. Jesus. I know. Freaking people are taking over. <laughs> are taking over. Or please. To took over. Already run, yeah. already run the joint. Um, and there was a newspaper track. There was a broadcast track. There was radio track. I didn't set foot in the broadcast building. The entire hmm. time I was at school. Never went. I so what did you want to be? I wanted to write for the Washington Post. I grew up in the D.C. area. I grew up in Maryland. I thought the Washington Post, I read All the President's Men probably a hundred times. I thought I the Washington Post it's was the, the most amazing thing that could ever exist in the world. I Were was you totally disappointed that Mark Felt was deep throat? <laughs> no, I wasn't. I, I, it didn't matter. I really wanted it to be Al Haig. It didn't matter. I just wanted it. it That's what matter. I wanted. It didn't matter. In my head, it was Al Haig, Haig the whole time. I would have been okay not knowing. Okay. I would have liked that too. Right? Sometimes when you want it to like, cut to, to black, it's like yeah. the Sopranos. You just, wanted to, you just yeah. want the mystery there. I'm with you. But yes, so I, that was my dream. And I went to Northwestern. So you um, wanted to do news reporting? No, no, no. Always or sports. sports reporting. Always okay. sports. But I just was in love with the paper and I yeah. thought it was great. And then, you know, as I got, I, I read it from the time I was a kid, but as I got older, you know, Mike Wilbon was there and Tony Kornheiser was there and Christine Brennan was there. I mean, it was really. And still is, but I mean, it, especially yeah. when I was a kid, when a kid idolizing something, you think it's the best thing ever, and I was like, "Wow, this is the best sports section." So, you, the best were you reason. one of the legendary interns? I was. Because Cor I saw Cornizer last week because we did PTI, and oh, we're also yeah. I'm I'm now in his will because I'm, I'm like part of his family. I'm really glad that we didn't have this discussion before you saw Cornizer. Oh, right, why? He's got like a lot of stories about me that I'm really glad didn't end up on the air. Oh, good conversation. But oh, for I'm next glad time. I didn't bring that up. But he always brags about. <laughs> Like, just the legendary interns yes. they've had. Yeah, yeah. So Including, I was one of them. I think the editor of The New Yorker, David Rudnick, might yeah. have even been. Well, he worked there. I don't know if he was an intern. I can't remember if he was an intern. But yeah. just, like, all the way through for the 80s and early 90s. Yeah. No, it was crazy. A so, murderer's row. Yeah. So I was an intern there. Uh, went to work for a little over a year down in Florida in a newspaper. Yeah. And then the hockey beat opened at the Washington Post. And the Caps? The Caps. So I did that for three years. And it was funny, uh, you know... You, I got that job when I was like 22 That's and a half. That's the best sport to cover. You loved it. I loved it. Loved it. Hockey players are the best. Loved it. But I'm 23 and I got the job that I had wanted. My That, that was going to be my life goal. Yeah. To get that job. You did. To you get peaked. a job. So Talking I was like, yeah. Talking to Adam after a game. It's over. It never, Oatsy. That was it. Oatsy. <laughs> Everything's a Y at the end of a hockey person. Well, you know what's amazing? Oh, hockey's the only sport where the nicknames, they make them longer. Yeah. Right? Totally. So... Or so, very like Jeff Carter, they call carts yeah. in the Kings. Occasion, yeah, Sometimes they'll add the S, but usually it's an I E or yeah, a Y. Make it a little longer. So, yeah. Do you play hockey at all? I know no, you but go. My son's I see into the Twitter it. Yeah, yeah, I go to the I go to the Kings games. Yeah. Now my son is like that's all he wants to do. A lot of early mornings as a parent, it's right? Brutal. It's, it's brutal. It's brutal. Yeah. It's bad. I, I think hockey is a, a good sport to spectate at. The, it's it's not a good parent sport. I have young children and I intend to never let them play hockey because I don't want to get up that early. Wise move. Yeah. So when how'd you end up at ESPN then? So then I worked at the Washington Post for 10 years, and I started doing some TV on the side. The, I was a Washington Capitals beat writer, and they had a deal to put the beat writer on the pregame show with the, oh. like, I was going to say George Michael sports machine, maybe? No, 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 Not no, no, a no. cup of coffee in the but, sports machine? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, so, like, by my, for my job, three times a week, I would go on the pregame show. Mm. So that gets you, right? That gets you. Get some reps. Reps. Get a little comfortable. Exactly. And then, you know, kind of went from there. Went to ESPN. Was there for almost a decade. And then now I'm Were you Turner. a John Walsh find? Uh, John Walsh was certainly involved. John Walsh and Mark Shapiro together. But Walsh probably now takes credit. I, I don't know. You have to ask him. Why are you being coy with me about I John Walsh? I he don't just know. retired. I know. I love He's John. probably watching this. He's I probably really happy John. right now, stroking just, his beard and just enjoying this I YouTube clip. I love John. Clip. I saw him like five days ago. I just don't know if he's walking around taking credit for me. Am okay. I someone you'd want to take credit for? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You were one of my favorite colleagues. Nice. I like um, that. So then you rose through. You did a lot, a whole bunch of things. Like this. Right. And then, yeah, now I work for Turner, which owns like 800 networks, which I didn't know when I signed the contract. So how has, how has the landscape changed for women in sports media since you broke in and you were covering Caps games? Well, okay. So it is better than it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you had a few people who were specifically looking to diversify their newsrooms. And that's a crappy term because it sounds very HRE. Yes, but, but it's a reality of life. It is a reality of life that if you have people who have different experiences and look at the world differently, you will end up with a product that is richer and that has more different perspectives on something. You have a different way of looking at something than Chris Berman. Yes. Okay. I'm going to take the male female race thing out of it, right? Yeah, you guys smart. are just. You I like just, what you did there. Okay. So you guys just look at the world differently, right? If you were we going to. We both like the Eagles. That's good. 
<laughs> if you guys were going to, if they both, if they said to both of you, you can design your own TV show. Just, just as an example, I don't know if anyone's done that with you. Yeah. But if you could, if they said to both I'd have of you, a lot you, of posters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can design your own TV show, make it look, be about anything you want, have it look like anything you want. We've seen what your vision is and what it looks like. Mm. We've seen, at least Chris has some influence on, on the NFL yeah. countdown, obviously. We've seen what his is. Very different shows. Yes. Right? And ESPN is a better network for having both of those shows on to serve the fans who might like both of those or might gravitate toward one or the other. That's what diversification is about. And when you look at racial diversification, when you look at male-female, then you are getting people who have had different life experiences, who see things differently. I definitely ask different questions than a lot of my male colleagues do. You get different answers. You bring all those answers to the table, and you can bring them to the reader or the viewer. So there were people 20 years ago looking to do that. The Washington Post, my ex-boss there, George Solomon, is notorious for having done that. He put Christine Brennan as the Redskins reporter on the NFL when nobody was putting yep. women on the NFL. In fact, there are not that many women who are the primary beat reporter for major newspapers on the NFL today, and it is 2015. He was doing it back in the 90s. So there are people like you now who were looking for it then, but they were fewer. That group has expanded. You were included in that. You are now a decision maker who runs Grantland, and you yes. are looking for some women. Let's talk about Grantland. Well, looking, and, looking for all, I would say looking for all types for of people. All and what you just said before is mm -hmm. really important because I think we have like 22 people or something working for us. Okay. And there's going to be points when everybody's in a large room. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about like, hey, let's come up with a theme week or mm -hmm. What do you think about this decision we just made with this important thing that happened that might have made us look bad or look good or whatever? Right. Yeah, I want more perspectives than just white dudes. Right. And you just want different perspectives. Yeah, you don't even like. Let's not even talk about white dudes versus yeah. black well, you know or women I mean, or whatever. Though. You just want different yeah. perspectives. You had a different background than you yeah. did, and you did, and you want like a nice little mix of of takes, and that kind of leads you to where the right path is. Right. So you want that, obviously, at the entry level, when you say, I'm looking for people, right? Mm -hmm. I think there is now a larger number of people than there used to be looking for people with different perspectives. Where the, I would say it's much larger yeah, than absolutely. 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Where I think the bottleneck is now is within those organizations, what people th when people think of their top positions... I don't think people are as open-minded about that as they like to think of themselves as. You mean in the executive level? I mean that... Or are you talking about like main hosts, main, all yeah. that stuff? Yes. Gotcha. So let's talk... There are exceptions, absolutely, but I don't think exceptions are the rule. People are always saying, oh, well, Doris Burke does some play-by-play. -play. Yes, and that is fantastic, and she's very good. But when you think about the thousands... I, it might be more than thousands. How many professional sporting events are called on TV every year? NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, hockey, like let's just go with those four, or NASCAR, you know, add yeah. those in. What percentage are called by a woman? I mean, it's infinitesimal, right? Yeah. Or have an analyst who's a woman even. It's not fair to bring in Doris because she's the most talented person in ESPN. But that's why the people say, but she Doris. actually can do five different jobs. Right. And you've seen her dribble. It's pretty impressive. Yes. It but, still has a handle. I know. Yeah. But. But that's my point, is that people say, oh, well, Doris Burke does play-by-play. -play. Okay, I mean, that's great, but Doris Burke is a singular example. Yeah. Um, the NBA project at ESPN has a female host. Yep. That's fantastic. Sage is terrific. How many other positions like that are filled by women? None. The yeah. baseball guy at Fox is a guy. The football guy at CBS is a guy. Right? The lead football host at ESPN is a guy. Well, part of the problem is turnover and people don't leave. And sometimes you get a job, you know, with somebody being in the same job for 20, 25, 30 years. Yeah, it is part of the problem. I mean, I'm not, I'm not blaming, right. you know, hatred as part yeah, of the yeah, problem. Yeah. I'm just saying that there is, there is a large-scale problem because you now have a generation of women who are in their 30s and 40s who aren't necessarily what people are looking for when they think of the best jobs. Hmm. And that's where I would love to see more change. With, with the NFL being an issue over the last six months, especially in relation to women's issues, we saw a lot of television networks put more women front and Scram center. Scrambling it to was, put women There was in. a lot of scrambling, yeah. <laughs> right? Or op-ed pieces by yeah. outside columnists. Oh, yeah. Well, what about the fact that women are capable of having an opinion on 
other issues besides women's issues. Yeah. That, that is a battle that is, that is hard fought. A lot of positions for women in television are asking men what they think. So if you're put in the host spot, you are asking men what they think, right? I'm asking the analyst what I think. I'm asking the reporter what they think. I'm asking the men around me what I think. My job is to read the prompter, maybe come up with some good questions, but ask someone else what they think. If I'm a sideline reporter, my job is to ask men what they think. Well, if you're the play-by-play guy or the analyst, or if you get to have more of a seat at the table as, as someone who's running a show or, or as a host or gets to be the lead voice at a network on a sport, or if you are the lead columnist at a newspaper, or if you are the lead writer for a magazine, uh, I recently read someone saying that all the senior writers at Sports Illustrated are men. Every single one of the se- senior writers at wow. Sports Illustrated is a man. I, this, the guys at Sports Illustrated are really progressive and really smart. I, I know those guys. They're great guys. But if you have no one in some of those more senior positions with a more diverse perspective, you're cheating the reader. You're cheating the television audience. And that's where I would love to see more women being even considered for those jobs because right now they're not. Well, that's why, I mean, we tried to hire Katie Nolan, which mm-hmm. kind of trickled out. Yeah. But um, one of the things I liked about her is, and maybe it's just because it's 2015 and I'm always looking at talent mm-hmm. over everything else, I just thought she was really funny. Yeah, she is. And it didn't, like, it wasn't like, hey, we need a whatever. It's mm-hmm. like, this person's just good. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we're inching closer and closer yeah. to that's how stuff works now versus checking off boxes and... Well, yeah, you know, I, I think talent's going to seep to the top. I hope so. And if you're good, you're, people are going to find you. But what do people, like, let's say some, some 22-year-old at Georgetown mm-hmm. comes up to you and says, give me one piece of advice. Tell me one thing that's going to help me. What would you tell them? I always tell young, anyone who's in college, I always tell them intern. Because I do think that getting experience while you're in college is sort of the, the key to unlocking the industry. Yeah. I feel like if you're if you're starting, I get sometimes twenty five or twenty six year olds telling me, "I want to start doing I want to start doing I like sports and I just I don't I went to law school and I didn't like it and then I you know I just want to get in I just want to whatever and that's great and I, and certainly people do but it, it's a I mean the secret's out right it's a it's a job a lot of people want mm. a lot of people start I mean I was interning for newspapers when I was seventeen and that was a long time ago. Like, you know, there's a lot of kids doing that now. There's kids who, especially with the barrier to entry lower, so doing their own podcast or webcast when they're in college or doing other kinds of things like that. And, and it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to start late. So that show, We Need to Talk, yeah. the CBS show, yeah. and it's just, it's women talking about sports. Yes. And they made a big deal. This is all female. Yes. They're going to talk about stuff, but they're just talking about, it seems like mostly just having the same conversations anyone else would have. Yes, which is the idea. It's right. not a women's issue show. Right. It is giving the women oppor- it is giving women the opportunity that men have had all over the rest of the dial. One of the great opportunities I have at CNN cuz Turner owns CNN and yep. CNN I all that stuff is that when a major sports story breaks, CNN has me come on, sit behind the desk and analyze sort of the larger points of the situation. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily X's and O's, because that's not what's right for their audience, but sort of what it means, what's important, what's the they are there, right? Women aren't given the opportunity to do that that often in sports media. Again, they're mostly asking guys what they think. So any television show that is focused on giving women the opportunity to do that is a good thing. Right. If Swing Cash or Lisa Leslie gets reps and reps on that show, and it makes them more comfortable and Some better. Cash is I'm, really good. Yeah. They're making the transition that male athletes have gotten for ages, getting the opportunity to transition from being an athlete to being on TV. And, of course, it's, you need reps, right? The advice to the college students, intern, right? Yeah. You need reps. You need practice. If that show is going to give them the opportunity to do that, which, frankly, they would not be getting True. most other places, and then they can segue into an analyst on an NBA broadcast because, hey, they're really good and polished now. Why isn't that a good thing? The other funny thing about that is where, let's say there's some all-female show or whatever, and people are like, eh, this isn't that good. And it's mm-hmm. like, there's a lot of not that good stuff yeah. on every channel Absolutely. and every radio station right now. Equal opportunity. Yeah. First of all, I think We Need to Talk is good. But there should I mean, be well, the, there I should be twice equal when they opportunity. Too many okay. Have they cut taking, down the number? Taking We Need to Talk off the table. I don't want to get it confused. But in general, there should yeah. be equal opportunity mediocrity as well, right? No, I'm with you. So. At least, like, well, you're going to be mediocre for a little bit, but you're going to yeah. get better. You're going to get reps. Everything's better. You're going to keep is moving. Is your first Grantland basketball show as good as your current one? 
Your no, last but one. I knew that going in. I, right. I knew our first one would, wouldn't be as good as the second one, right. and it would just you keep going. You need opportunity, and you yeah. need opportunity not just at the entry level. And that's that's part of, of I what able, I would love to see move forward. I mean, I had I did like 15 PTS, didn't mm-hmm. know what I was doing. Yeah. I did two years of the NBA show, mm-hmm. and it wasn't really until near the end of the first year of the NBA show that I even started to feel like I knew what I was doing. And that's a, those are a lot of high profile reps that were good. Yeah. And not everyone gets not that. Not everyone chance. gets that shot. But I mean, I look at you, and you know, I was bummed when 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 you switched companies. And I take that as a compliment. Thank you. It is a compliment. But I never felt like you were totally used right. I always thought, like, I, want, I wanted more of your brain. Thank you. In the company. Well, that was part of the draw of the job I took. I loved working at ESPN. I, I have zero complaints about ESPN. People are always like, why did you leave? Like, there's some big story there. I know. God there's, forbid right, anyone leaves. Right, right. But there's no story. I really loved it. And they were very great to offer me. But did you ever think about, like, a terrific deal could I do stay? PTI? Could, you, could I step in there? Could I do a couple around the horns? Because now all I of a sudden around the horn guy that's, diversified. That's how, that's how I ended up at my current job. Right. I, I have lots of ideas about what I can do. Yeah. And, and Turner was great about, you know, Turner has a lot of different opportunities. And they were great about saying, you're really smart. And we want to be able to use all the aspects of what you can do on our various networks. So when I'm on CNN or CNN International, which has huge, crazy reach around the world, which I didn't fully realize before I took the job there, yeah. is the world's largest television network. I mean, you turn on any TV in any country and CNN I is there. So my role for them is what we were just talking about, about sort of breaking down the larger points of sports issues. That's something I wouldn't have gotten a chance to do in other places. But then I also have a role on TNT, which is hardcore X and O NBA, which right. is also something I can do. I watch you. Sometimes you're at Clipper games. Mm-hmm. And sideline reporters do a lot of walking. Yeah, in heels. You're, what, you're just, yeah, that's right. You're wearing, I'm sure. Because you have to wear like the whatever. Yeah. But you're kind of moving around all I over am. the place. I am. I was kind of secretly waiting for you to come into the aisle and interview me, but you, don't, you haven't cared. <laughs> I mean, you're big time, but... No, it's just kind of just one time, like somebody cancels or right. something. Well, I'm, I'm holding my Popcornopolis. Right. I have some thoughts on whatever <laughs> I'm watching. Put, DeAndre I'll, Jordan. I'll put you on the list. <laughs> Wait, tell me about, you were talking about how the locker room scene still isn't like the greatest place on the planet. What did you mean? What do you mean? Oh, no, I was we talking about the We were talking about what room. it was like in the 90s and stuff. Yeah. And you were like, well, now it's not the best either. But well, so no, what's not great the, about it? It's not the locker room stuff. I mean, yes, when we, it was off the Lisa Olsen thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but yes, what's, Lisa so what's Olsen's like primary issue was the locker room. But I was thinking about the Lisa Olsen stuff after it. After she became yes. the flashpoint. Yep. I think what you guys exposed in the 30 for 30 and some of us knew just from knowing Lisa previously, previous to that is just the, I mean, the crazy react negative reaction. It doesn't even cover it, right? I mean, people I was, threatening her life, yeah, threatening to rape her. That was her, my team. It was slashing awful. Slashing her tire. I mean, like, really scary stuff. She's trying to break up the Patriots. So it right. was like that kind of, right. like, insane stuff. I think that for most women in sports media, it is not like that. And it wasn't like that for Lisa before that incident. I do think that social media, and this is not a woman in sports media problem. This is just women on the Internet issue. I mean, there's been a ton of coverage lately of just... How mean sort people of, are. It's not mean. I mean, it's, it's, it's way beyond mean. I mean, it's, it's threatening. Yeah. You know, and, and I've been very fortunate. I haven't been on the receiving end of that, and I think most people don't end up in that space. But when you, if somebody falls into it for a reason that, like, in Lisa's case, it's completely, I mean, she didn't do anything, mm. right? Then it is, it is scary space. See, I think social media is just awful for everybody. Okay, are you in the Charles Barkley camp? But you're no, on not, social media. No, no, I'm not talking about that. Right. I'm just saying, like, hip- the negative stuff. Right. I think it's equal opportunity hatred when they start putting that stuff around. Like, it's, it's just venom everywhere. Like, it who, is. Who, who, are, who is that crew nice to? Right. You know? <laughs> no, no, it's I... It's not like, I, oh, they're being mean to these people. But these people, they're treat Like, yeah. it's just there's people out there that get internet muscles, and they start going after people. And I don't think they yes. care who it is. I think that that's absolutely true. The way they do it with women, like it's, uh, it's particularly Emma Watson, right? Yeah, was the one you know, actress from Harry Potter went to speak at the UN about gender equality, right? Yep. This was her really controversial message: women should have the same rights as men. That was it. That was that was it's pretty crazy, right? And also that men should be supportive of that. I think that was her dual message: he for she was her platform, that kind of thing. So she makes a lovely speech. 
She talks about this nutty idea that women should be able to, you know, walk into the same rooms men walk into, maybe get paid for doing the exact same work, that sort of thing. And after she did that, not only did she get a wave of hate mail, but a lot of it was sexual in nature. Mm. And there was what, what a lot of people didn't connect, but she's come out later and talked about, is maybe three or four weeks later, there was this big, like, nude photo leak of her. Did she get it? But it wasn't her. Uh. But someone had photoshopped and was threatened. So in the weeks in between, apparently they, she had gotten pretty high-level threats. If you don't shut up, we're going to leak nude photos of you. That's that's sort of the different. It's not that worse or not as bad in terms of the internet, but as the different category that happens with women. Is it right if I play this three minute clip for my daughter the next time she asks me if she can get an Instagram account? Yeah, seriously, <laughs> it's scary. Why I have, can't I have one, Dad? It's like right. well, there's there's actually a million reasons why you can't have one. But no, yeah. I mean I have three year old twin girls, yeah. and I am I am absolutely pathologically afraid of what's going to happen in ten years when they have a computer. Yeah. We may, like, move to, you know, an island before that. My daughter has email. How old is she? She turns 10 in two months. Mm. Okay. She's got, but there's going to be that one kid in, in class who gets the phone soon. Yeah. It's always the one. It's always the one. You live in L.A. I'm kind of surprised I that know. there aren't, like, I do 10 live in kids LA. on their phone. I always, it's, it's, some of that stuff's a little, we're going to suck you in at one point yes. to the L.A. area. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but it, I think when 10, it becomes like that a little... Becomes they a, have this, so why... And right. then that, all that starts. Right. can already feel it happening. But <laughs> I don't, the social media, like all that stuff, just, you know, it, when you're a parent, you just look at it totally differently mm -hmm. in ways that uh, shake me to my very core. <laughs> <laughs> so what... What? Uh, you had a show, Unguarded. Yeah. Do you still have a show? What happened to it? I have specials now. You have specials now. Special. We did a special at the Super Bowl. The We're time doing... slot wasn't great. The time slot was not great. Friday um, at ten thirty or whatever. That's not, not not great. It was it was a tough fit with their other programming and where to put it. I understand. Every time we tried to move it somewhere, it was sort of they would say right, but this and and I would say yeah, you know that kind of thing. So so I. I but you I got, got unbelievable that. guests though. I did. Thank you. Um, I think I think. People would like to sit down for smart conversations, and that was. What I was we were ready. Doing. Yes. <laughs> well. <laughs> I was ready. Sort of. I had some mitigating circumstances. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Bill got into a little bit of I trouble, to, trouble during right? our scheduled time. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't talk about that. <laughs> See, that was yet again the forces conspiring against us. It was. It was but one of the many forces. Point. But yes. Yeah, so now I do specials. Uh, CN yes. Yeah, so CNN uh, had a bunch of shows that were sort of specialized news topics. So my show was sports. Um, Sanjay Gupta had a medical show, right? Crossfire was the political show. Um, and they made a large-scale sort of economic and programming decision to jettison all of those shows. So in sort of a two-day period, an entire category of was programming just was just taken vaporized. off the air. So in the sports world, the only show of that that people paid attention to was of that, that group from CNN was my show. They were like, oh, the sports show got taken off the air. And we were like, no, but everyone got taken off the air. I mean, Sanjay Gupta's show. I mean, all yeah. those shows. So um, what we've lucked out in is that we have these events. You know, m most of those other topics, medicine or the, the money show got taken off the air, stuff like that. They don't have these events, or, but we do. So we did a special at the Super Bowl I hosted. We are doing a special at the Final Four I'm going to host. I'm hosting a special at the Masters. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff. So it's available good. Get, in podcast form or no? I think it's on the internet, CNN. Are you too cool for a whatever. podcast? Is that what's going on? You know, it's funny. I've never done you're too, you're regular radio or podcast. Your I don't IQ know. might be too high. Is that true? Yeah, I just uh, barely got things? under the IQ do you, barrier. Do you run out of things to talk about, or you huh? feel there is an infinite number of things that people want to hear? I think you'd be really good on. at it. No, I'm asking about you. About me? Yeah. Do I run? No, because I don't write as much as I used to. Right. So with the yeah. podcast, though, you I feel like you, there's yeah. I love doing the podcast because okay. I get to talk to people like you. That's good. Like we we would always run into each other and yeah. talk, but we would never actually. We would never do it as talk. performance. Yeah. Yeah. So playoffs, playoffs, Eastern Conference. Right. So first two rounds, Eastern well, Conference. I'm doing the NCAA tournament. Oh. So oh. where's that going to be? Where's the know? NCAA tournament no, going to be? No, where are you going? It's this event that they hold all no, over the country. That. I know that. <laughs> where are you going, though? Um, I believe, Do you know what regions? I believe I'll be in Louisville the first weekend. You may have to edit that out if Ooh. my assignment gets changed. Okay. But, yeah, so so that's the And where's the Final plan. Four this year? In Indianapolis. 
home of Escoba. It, that they have it, the NCAA explained to us they have a special relationship with the city of Indianapolis. Dirty little secret about Indianapolis. One of the best places to have any sporting event. They have a steak and shake downtown that's the open best. 24 hours. Indianapolis is the best. There's a lot of media people who like that. It's the so, best. Yeah. I would Miami, New Orleans, Indianapolis. Those are my three favorites. San Diego? San Diego's like kind of, I don't know, it's spread out. I don't like spread out with my sporting events. I like, I like when there's pockets. New Orleans, my all-time favorite. New Orleans is the best. Best city to visit. You want you you to be able to walk. If you haven't been to New Orleans, go visit New Orleans. It's just built for sporting events. Best it's just food, a Super Bowl there, there. Yeah. Because you walk out the door in New Orleans, you know where you are. This is, this is, you travel a lot, right? I try not to travel as much as I could. <laughs> That's I, a wise man. I try man. to be a decent family man. <laughs> right. Try. <laughs> How's that going for you? <laughs> try to be a decent. I don't know. Ask my wife. Okay. <laughs> we could bring her, her on here for performance She'll podcast. She'll never come on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. she's a wise It'll woman. never happen. All right. So if you travel a lot, yeah. you know that there are a lot of American cities where you could walk out the door and if somebody had blindfolded you on the plane there, you might you not know where you were, yeah. right? Are you, you always in Houston? Know where you are, in New are you in Denver? Yeah. Are you in, right? All that stuff. New Orleans, I love cities where you walk out the door and you know where you are, where the people are distinct, where the culture is distinct, where the landscape is distinct, where the food is distinct. You walk out the door in Seattle, you know where you are. Right? San Francisco's like that. Right? San Boston's Francisco, like that. Boston, yeah. New Orleans. That's and a good one. It's pretty great. I mean, that's one of the things that is great about our job, even with your limited travel, that getting, to, besides the sporting events, which everyone knows it's great to be at and, and yeah. all of that, but getting to see, this is a pretty big and amazing country yeah. to get to. I have flown from New Orleans to Seattle. That's a pretty crazy flight to take off in New Orleans in the bayou and land in the Pacific Northwest and my watch the country was, pass by out the window. Yeah, my favorite is when you find out stuff like, we had to go to Memphis one year for the show. Right. And, and you're like, like, oh, oh this Memphis is Memphis? the best. This is great. They have a trolley? Right. <laughs> and chicken. Right. I love it here. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> now, yeah. now we all know the key to Bill Simmons' heart. No, I, mean, I like I like when it's easy. I, I mean, first of all, my hotels. I, I need to have coffee within a block. Mm -hmm. Don't make it hard for me to find coffee in the morning because I, I got my glasses Your on. Your producer barely would awake. not let me put the coffee on the table. I know. Well, he's. I'm not going to defend him. Right? Uh, Did nobody knows there's coffee yeah, there's right coffee. down there, and there's I'm coffee. not allowed to. Put we don't it on like the table. to give free advertising to people that don't want to pay for it. <laughs> is the way we work. No, but I'm, I like coffee near my hotel, and mm -hmm. that's it. Okay. And then I like I like feeling like I'm in a place that I couldn't normally get. So I'm with right. you where like you walk out and you're like, oh, this is cool. This but is... Indianapolis made me feel like that and I wasn't prepared for it. That's good. Just kind of down home, cool. Everything was yeah. contracted. And there's a um, steak and shake. Right, we have to go. 24 hours. What are you doing in Austin? Anything uh, panels? Yes, I'm leading. Hosting stuff? I'm, I'm moderating two panels. Okay, good. I am moderating NASCAR and Major League Baseball talking about the future of technology and sports. And I am moderating a Funny or Die panel, talking okay. about athletes trying to be funny. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. I'm glad we fun. finally did this. Back with more uh, from Austin South by Southwest after this. Before I get the fan off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Geico presents Strange Savings Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance.